What is up, Living Soil Nerds, uh, Cannabis Dorks, Dirt Dorks, all the people that have been rocking us uh, with us for the last few years now. I was going over some of the earlier videos uh, to prep for this week, and one of the things that I noticed is just how much uh, you know I've learned. We were just I was just talking to uh, Marco, how much he's learned over just these past years from a lot of this stuff. And so secondary metabolites in the early days, when I was trying to learn this stuff and we were using house and garden products and we were spending a lot of money on root boosters or shooting powders and all this kind of stuff was that we were supposedly trying to get secondary metabolites. And so in the early days, I don't know if we necessarily even knew what that meant. And so the old heads would talk about, well, you guys, you know, when we'd ask like, okay, critique the plants that we have, well, we weren't growing healthy plants then. So they would talk about, well, you don't have to really worry about trichome heads until you figure out how to grow a healthy plant. And, you know, in the early days, I guess we kind of took that as a, as a slight and um, didn't really understand what, what they were trying to get at by using, you know, these gentlemen at the time were using more of like the guanos in those days and, and trying to understand that there's more of like that microbial life. And so to get that to the next level, uh, it took me almost a decade or so uh, to understand what these guys were trying to teach me a long time ago. And so the, the primary metabolites, the way the plant just basically grows, right, the stalk and the leaves and all of that, that's obviously paramount. And I don't think enough people understand that or, or enough people uh, are focused on that. They're too focused on building the trichomes. And so understanding plant science, uh, really trying to get secondary metabolites you obviously have to have the, the, you know, the first floor built before you're going to be able to put on the second floor. And so many people are worried about the finished product. When you actually look at their plants, especially in veg, it's very telling to what is going to happen uh, later on down in, into the flower aspects. And so there are people in this community that I admire. And our guest today is one of them because he runs a large commercial facility building soil. But not only making and building these soils is consistent and consistent enough that a bunch of famous places here in Denver, Colorado and Colorado all over use his soil to make sure that their plants and everything that they're doing uh, make sure that it's, it's healthy. And so that microbial life was lost on me for a, for a long time. And that's why, you know, kind of, I guess, getting back to the roots of understanding some of the simpler stuff, but just coming at it with a lot more knowledge this time, especially from Marco. And so I want to throw it over to him real quick. I want to give kind of a salute to Bart. Bart is sick today. Uh, so we got um, uh, some issues with that. So uh, unfortunately, like if he gets too sick, then we'll have to cut it short. But just appreciate you, Bart, coming on here, talking with us today. I'm going to throw it over to Marco and we're going to get right into it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. OK, Bart's back. <clears throat> yeah, man. Um, Secondary metabolites, you know, they're important. You know, they're very important because, you know, one definition and you can look up and start digging into secondary metabolites if you're not exactly up to speed. But we're going to catch you up on this show. You know, it's basically substances that plants make to make them competitive in their own environment. <clears throat> so what that means is that plant is going above and beyond to do something to express itself, to give off something to make itself better within its own environment. And like Brian said, you know, you got to start on the first floor. You know, when we build a building, we start on the ground. You can never start above that. So starting on the ground on that first floor to me is just getting um, that environment dialed in, that soil dialed in and getting the right genetics, you know? So those are kind of your basis. And once you do that, then we can talk about building, the, uh, getting the plants to jump in and create those secondary metabolites. So we don't want to get too, ahead of ourselves. I want to introduce Bart. Bart knows a lot about this stuff. He's been reading uh, some current papers. And we were talking before the show on how important uh, biology is to secondary metabolites, something that I've always preached, not on a scientific level, but just on my experience level. And so Bart's been reading some um, some just new info that, that kind of reemphasizes that. So, man, I know we got a lot to talk about, Bart. Thanks for being here, man. I was sick 
<laughs> like on Christmas morning with that flu. I know it's a mother. So thank you. And um, I'll let you jump in and just kind of get started, bro. Yeah, thanks, Marco. Good old flu, eh? We threw, a, <laughs> we threw a pretty big show this weekend, and it seemed like some folks there probably had it. So if you've got the flu, don't go out to shows. That's that's my preach for today. But Stay your ass home. <laughs> that's it. But uh, hang, hanging in there, and yeah, nice to be chatting about this with y'all, because it is something that I've been fascinated with recently, and really would love to uh to chat with you guys about because like you said so much of this stuff that we've all kind of believed uh maybe intuitively as living soil people um folks are really taking the crazy microscopes and the crazy <coughs> spectroscopy techniques and and really getting to the bottom of this um it's wild to see in in that paper that you were mentioning uh, just now, which is linking plant secondary metabolites and plant microbiomes, a review by like 15 people. Um, they, they really, uh, they really went deep with probably over a dozen different techniques. Yeah, that's good. <clears throat> so, well, here's, I'll tell you this kind of my experience. So, you know, diving into the natural farming um it's been what six shit, six years now probably or so you know early on i would hear like when i first getting into it i would hear like you know those ffjs and those fpjs are what you know boost your you know metabolites boost your flowers like a bloom booster you know and people were almost i felt like using those things like they were some kind of bloom booster um and to me man i tell you i tried that route and to me, my terpenes, things just got better, improved even more um, when I got out away from that sugar, you know, and I went to more Jadam methods where I'm talking just plant, water and microbes, you know, keeping it simple. So I don't think that I don't know, man, some people may have great success. I think that the sugar game is kind of overrated. And I think they use that. Some people use that as a substitute bottle, almost like almost a substitute crutch. Like, you know, when you jump from hydro, you go to soil. Well, now you get your crutches, the, the bloom boosters and FFJs and stuff like that. So um, I my experience is, though, you know, that's not the key. My experience is like Bart kind of alluded to the biology, you know, increasing that biology, increasing that diversity. That's why I'm so big on IMO. I think that is where that connection between that secondary metabolites and the um and, and, you know and and the soil kind of meet if you will um what do you think barb because building soil and all that's got to kind of that's important to you now because now you can kind of folk you know change your maybe even your thought process on building your soil has this has this paper kind of done that or are you already or are you already focused on that biology and your soil and well you know, it's you, always always interesting to me but like you're talking about with knf um as as some of these plant extracts have happened um i do feel like you're kind of again creating a very soluble um nutrient and you know you can you can get crazy results out of that if you do it right we've all seen <clears throat> we've all seen folks um do salts and do it well you know really blow plants up they've got some swole ass arnold schwarzenegger plants that are crazy and frosty but you look at the 87 crazy things they put into their mix to get there and and is that really what i want no not not really i'm a lot more interested in learning how to work with plants how to make growing easier, how to make the plants healthier and how to minimize my inputs to try to achieve the results. And, you know, like, like we all know, one of those classes of secondary metabolites, terpenes is probably our favorite part of the whole thing, even, even in food and fruit, like what is something without flavor? So it's really cool to me that, um, that you can get to those high terp profiles without having to pump stuff. And in the same way that I don't want to pump the plant with salts, I feel like some of the soluble natural fertilizers 
are like you're saying just recreating the same situation where we've gamed the plant's ability to decide and i think it was albrecht that i first learned in a plant grown in a natural environment has full bidirectional control of both water and nutrients and so it can be putting out nutrients at the same time it's taking in water and if you if you have a soluble nutrient you've bypassed the plant's ability to choose and decide and i think you're kind of um missing out on some of the mechanization advantages that nature has built in to provide for you so you know i'm a i'm a i'm a firm believer in letting plants eat what they want i love loading them up with the smorgasbord and really you know going for those higher yields and bigger plants but all while trying to as much as i can work with the plant's immune system you know and not to say that i never use a salt like all I'll use gypsum for stuff. I'll use a natural salt of calcium like that, but I'm very sparing on it. And, you know, Elaine Ingham would take me to take me to school for that. She'd be like, Oh no, you can't use any gypsum. But I really feel like there are times when a touch of a soluble nutrient can add a lot, but I just said, I think use, use that kind of stuff as sparingly as you can. And as you've seen, you've been able to get there with your other techniques. And so there are other ways. And that's the really cool, cool way to do it, in my opinion. Yeah. And I, and I think, too, Bart, like another thing that kind of people miss is the focus on building that soil. I think that initial soil build is, is key, too. You know, I do use gypsum. I put that in my initial soil build. But some people kind of fast forward over that initial soil build and just get right on into it, you know, and get on into the inputs and get on into the natural farm, you know, and all that. But to me, that soil, that's where you're going to have, that's that foundation. That's starting that phase one ground level, building that building. That soil is your foundation. So don't skimp on that. Get a good recipe. Get one that's, um, get one that's proven. You know what I mean? Go find your really nice recipe that's proven and then tweak it. And then make that yours. But if you kind of just skip over that and think you're going to get what everything you need in a bag and then kind of go from bag to, you know, boom to, I don't know. I think you're selling yourself short. I think you can do more. You know what I mean? Because I always say even though any bag as great as it may be, if I add some IMO to it now, it's a little better. You know, you can always just increase things just a little bit. So, For you know, sure. Yeah. Don't skip that stuff for sure. And, and some people just don't have the time or the, the ability, you know, and they need to buy products and that's great too. But if you have the skills to do it, there's nothing as rewarding as <clears throat> creating, creating your own living soil mix. And it's why I got into it for a living. I just loved doing that and had seen results that I had never seen out of any product that I had bought. And so, um, you know, all of that added up to me being like, all right, I'm crazy enough. I'm going to, I'm going to give this a go. And even then when I launched into it, I had no idea what I was in for. I thought I knew, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a bottomless rabbit hole and that's what makes it fun. It's, it's why I want to do this one for the rest of my life is that I don't think I'll ever get sick of learning about it. And the fact that I still enjoy these papers, you know, and seeing what, 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 as, as it gets picked apart, it's like quantum science or quantum physics. You, it's just always so amazing when you see how it all actually really works down in the guts. I, mm -hmm. I don't think I'll, I'll ever get tired and we'll probably, it'll be a long time till we really, really know, but boy, they're sure going a whole layer deeper right now. And that's fascinating to me. And I will, let me just add this to Bart, not to let it steer anybody wrong. You can buy bag soil, but something like uh, peonia soil, that's a, that's a top tier. You can grow out of that. That is that's a fully, you know, built soil. I'm saying watch out buying these bullshit bags and thinking that's your 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 um your gonna be your soil. You know, you gotta go to me a well blended soil, something like yours, uh hard or better. You know, what I mean better meaning you built it yourself. And that's it. And that, that's the only reason I'm saying that, because you just kind of did your own thing. But yeah, man, um so <laughs> what do you what do you so how do you increase those populations in your soil like when you build your soils right i know you get them sent out for testing it's a proven recipe but then do you test the microbiology too the bacteria and the fungi as part of that process 
we do. We send off samples and our our guy that we like these days is Zach Wright in uh, North Dakota. He uh, he was a student of Alanningham and <clears throat> I really feel like his thought process lines up with mine. I met him at the uh, Soil Health Food and Farm Forum in Montrose two years ago, which is one of my favorite little local conferences here on the West Slope. And I was speaking at it and we were out to dinner and we just really hit it off. And it's, uh, it's fascinating to me how he, how he looks at the microbiome and his microscopy work is, is unparalleled. He put it up on the screen and was, you know, chasing bacteria and stuff like that. It, it was wild watching the stuff he was doing on the big screen in Montrose there. So, um, yeah, Zach's who I like to go to for that. I've got scopes too, and I've got Ingham's old guide and I, all scope stuff and I've got a rough feel for it. You know, I rarely do the full breakdown. If I want, if I want to quantify um, at least the main groups, I'll send it off to the lab, <clears throat> but you know, I can definitely look through the scope and be like, Oh, that's all bacterial or Hey, there's some spores or there's some big fungal organism hyphae or some little fungal organism hyphae or, um, at least, at least go to that level. And you just sort of start getting a good gut to be able to quick check it when you don't want to spend a hundred bucks or whatever. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a combination of both of those and it's really interesting over summer, winter, when you, when you get into it with people like Johnson and Sue, do you know them? Yeah, um, they yeah they built that compost method. Uh, yeah, I like yeah, that. exactly. Mm -hmm. Two doctors. Yeah, and so I do something fairly similar to what they do, but um, like they'll tell you that you have to keep your compost from freezing, and that's pretty hard to do in any sort of northern latitudes. And so, um, you know, it it is a whole. It, it's it's a whole game of like what's doable and are you really going to fill your they're like fill your basement up with compost ain't nobody got a basement for that like are you serious who's going to fill up their yeah. basement <laughs> <laughs> that's that's it you got to be pretty dedicated if your whole basement's for your compost for to keep it all warm for the winter so for me as long as i have spores i'm happy the spores will make it Sure, the mycelium's probably going to die in the winter, mostly. Some of my piles stay warm enough and are right in that magic zone between thermophilic and curing, fully curing, where they'll they'll keep stuff warm all winter. And that helps re-inoculate. Um, I build piles of, of stuff to inoculate. Sometimes we take trips up to the woods. It's a, it's a whole effort to kind of build this biology. And then I have kind of a zone four zone five little bit of a uh it, in permaculture kind of a an area where no people go into and that surrounds my compost yard so spores definitely blow in on the wind and those are the primary methods that i use to try to culture this high species diversity but a long cure in the compost is a huge part of it and that was something um, Johnson and Sue really showed they had like, <clears throat> they had a slide. What, one of the slides they said was 30 grand or something like that. And it was all DNA sequencing and with this shotgun DNA sequencing, which is one of the techniques in this paper, um, they really have now been able to show all the species that are, that are in your compost and yeah, it costs a lot of money, but it's it's badass to see so we're we're right on the cusp of having the technology to be able to sequence dna rapidly and that's that's going to blow this whole thing open and so johnson and sue showed that the cure just basically that species diversity increases the longer the cure is and that that correlated with my beliefs and it was pretty fascinating to me to see that what so on that same line of thinking um 
do we know how how long could compo like it can it be overdone do you diminish in microbial activity after a certain time i guess once it's consumed itself yeah um i mean i it it depends on the environmental conditions if it's just out baking all summer you know you might beat it up or something like that i think i think environmental conditions are more of a factor than time um but if you're at least what Johnson and Sue showed is if you're using their method to the T, you will do nothing but increase species diversity over time. It was it was pretty much linear. Nice. Yeah, I got it. Uh, so in the early days, there was, uh, you know, everybody's using metal halides for veg and then HPS for uh, flour. And so the old heads were saying that what we were doing, especially in the basement, with the amount of heat that was being generated with the double ender uh, is basically we're a catch 22 for ourselves. And I wanted to ask you that Bart, like in the early days, do you think anybody, even if we were pheno hunting and all of these things is supposedly looking to improve all of these secondary metabolites, if the room is too, too hot, I mean, some of it is formed, but if we're supposedly pheno hunting, are, were we missing a lot in the early days because we were running these super heavy, um, almost like blasting the plants with lights uh only maybe sometimes eight feet um i know in my basement it was eight feet and we would try to, to find some places where we could get it up to 10 feet yeah for sure i mean it's always so tricky and i feel like commercial cultivation suffers from a little bit from the culture of being stuck in an eight foot room um, i see a lot of people that do a lot of techniques purely because we look came from this world of having to hide in basements and things like that. And so um, temperature is a huge, a huge part of it. Now being a desert grower out here, I know some, I know some folks who are some pretty top grower breeders and some of them will rock these greenhouses that are so hot. I mean, I see them rocking temps 115 and above and their philosophy is that they can feed, feed, feed out of it. And, you know, there is, it's, well, I wouldn't do any of that and I'm not into it. It's been crazy for me to see that they actually can achieve some results here in the desert in extremely hot <coughs> environments. So it is technically possible now. Um, you know, secondary metabolites, as Marco was kind of getting to in the beginning, are essentially plant responses to stress. The, the primary metabolites are doing the main work of creating the structure of the plant, the cells, the um, doing, doing photosynthesis with chlorophyll. Those are all primary metabolites. They're doing the, you know, reproducing all of that, whereas the secondary metabolites are seemingly there to deal with mostly with stress conditions whether it's pests pathogens temperature stress water stress stresses like that so um in a lot of ways the stress will actually produce more secondary metabolites but you kind of have to watch out that you're producing the ones you want you know and that's the thing i've seen i i have seen heat stress plants that seem to have reduced terpenes but maybe they've got more flavonoids or what are some of the other ones, you know, steroids, uh, alkaloids, these are all secondary metabolites in plants. So, um, you know, they, flavonoids. Oh, yeah, it's a whole, it's, it's whole own world there. Yeah. And, and that guy, there's uh, the guy from Florida. I still want to get him on the show. He was like the flavonoid monster he knew more about flavonoids than anyone i've ever met that'd so, be nice yeah it was it was really interesting but when i met aaron appleby that dude was there too i can't remember his name right now but he knows a lot so uh yeah i don't know it, it's it's all interesting and then the relationships to the minerals that's its whole own crazy thing and since that was kind of the the point of this show maybe we can drop into a little of that but uh you know, it's it's fascinating to me how like there was this whole world and, and this other article I was reading recently by John Kempf, it was talking a lot about um, how 
the original science in horticulture and plant biology really focused on this concept of ions and there being like an ion pumping mechanism in the plant. And all of that happens to be true. It all exists, but we're, we're getting into a world where we're now starting to understand that the ions are somewhat redundancy. They, you don't totally need that ionic transfer and a good example are the trees that we see on a rocky cliff that have almost no soil to work with. Um, <clears throat> you know, you, you see those trees thriving somehow and there's not enough ionic transfer to account for those trees being able to survive on a, on a rocky cliff. And that's where the biologists have really um, gone down the rabbit hole of, of showing that the plants are able to um, do this, what is it, cyto, endo, endocytosis, where they suck up bacteria, carry them vascularly from the roots through the plant, and then absorb the bacteria right into the cell and consume the bacteria as primary plant fertility. And, and that fascinates me. It's, it's a crazy thing. So that's another way that we're transferring soil minerals to the plant that we a lot of folks weren't even taking into account <clears throat> is through this bacterial transfer. And then on the fungal side, you have fungal organisms like our buscular mycorrhiza that are, have penetrated into the cell wall and can go out and use enzymes to break down minerals in the soil and deliver them directly to the cell. So there are all these layers of complexity that we don't really we don't really think about, but I guess if I was going to take four primary elements in the soil that I think are critical to secondary metabolite production, it's going to be phosphorus, calcium, boron, and silica, you know, and then obviously your trace minerals like zinc and manganese are going to, going to come next, but really those four do most of the heavy lifting of of that part of the plant's production. It's like um, ADP and ATP. Do you know those chemicals? Right. Of oh, them. Those, that's like the, yeah, know. yeah, do you mind kind of going down that for the layman? Catalyst, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, they're, they're, it's adene, adenosine diphosphate and adenosine triphosphate. Okay. And, and so that's how the plant delivers phosphorus in a natural ecosystem, primarily from its roots. And so, um, you know, how much of that is handled microbially and how much of it is delivered um, just by the standard ionic pumping mechanism that plants have built in is, is still up for debate. This is one of the mysteries, right. but there's a lot more biology happening there than we would have thought. And so... You know, one of the things phosphorus is critical for is genetic code transfer. Um, and it, it really works with calcium and phosphorus is so easy to lock up. Um, I would, I can't say enough about um, really using calcium to, um, kind of prevent it, it calcium is going to help chelate phosphorus and it's going to prevent lockout from interaction with iron, um, aluminum chlorides, things like that. And so you kind of have to look at a lot of these minerals together and, and the way they work with the plant is so fascinating and complex, but <clears throat> yeah. And that's on a chemical level, right? So then like you were saying, we don't know how much of that is the i'm oh, sorry the so on the mineral level we don't even know if the minerals are just attracting the biology and then now that's also um, contributing to it you know what i mean so i think that that's part of it because the each of those minerals is going to tr attract certain different microbiology and then that plant re react relationship between that biology and that microbe to me is probably key as well on the secondary metabolites, not just the mineral itself. You know what I mean? Well, that's for sure. And really the, the phosphorus with the ATP and ADP 
are like the end product. You know, the plant gets the phosphorus to the cells and then it does photosynthesis. And now you've created these new um, metabolites and they're new primary metabolites that then go out and do the whole photosynthesis process, create chlorophyll and things like that that create the energy of the plant and then once the plant's done with that then it can put some of that energy into creating secondary metabolites um so mm. you know we we still don't know how they get there you're completely right that's that's the mystery here but once it gets there that's when this this chemical engine in the plant cell creates the adp and the atp and it's really cool to me that that is where a, a lot of the magic happens is with those metabolites. And your soil will already have these built in, like ready to make that reaction with the plant. Is that kind of how you look at it? Yeah, well, I do put a lot of different um, phosphorus containing elements into my soil. And I would say the, the two places I primarily get phosphorus um, are from uh, fish bone meal, which is nitrogen and phosphorus. And, um, I've, I've got kind of a fancy fossilized seabird guano and it's been chelated over time. You know, it's, it's pterodactyl poo, basically. Like <laughs> micronized, basically kind of almost looks like clay at this stage. <laughs> it, they, they grind it up. It, it almost looks like a heavy sand, but over time, um, really literally just the effects of time have changed the chemical structure of it from what it was into a different kind of phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And what I like about that stuff is that it's not super soluble. It's not completely insoluble. So we're getting some of that ionic pumping transfer, but it doesn't hurt my species diversity. And um, I, I do feel like the biology consumes it and can also deliver that uh phosphorus through biological action is that easier on heavy metals too than compared to some of your other stuff out there i bet well yeah and it's the reason i don't use soft rock phosphate is because a lot of the soft rock soft rock phosphate has polonium 210 in it mm. which is a pretty crazy radioactive isotope that um uh is just naturally occurring in a lot of soft rock phosphate. And <clears throat> there was a lot of interesting research done. I, I saw this almost 10 years ago that suggests that maybe like the primary reason that most tobacco smokers get lung cancer isn't necessarily how toxic nicotine is, which it is. And I actually think that that contributes most of the, the pathogenic effects of cigarette tobacco smoking, but um, they were suggesting that potentially the polonium 210 is a big part of that. And there really haven't been enough studies on, on polonium 210 in fertilizer supply, but tobacco needs a ton of FOSS, just like cannabis. And it, it is usually really highly fertilized with soft rock phosphate. So that's, that's kind of why I focus on those elements is they, they're very low in heavy metals and other toxins. Yeah, yeah, that's important, man. I see a lot of people still, you know, hitting that kelp hard, man. But uh, that's it. Yeah, the northern now, yeah. kelp just has too much arsenic in it, and so we had to we had to go to the inland Icelandic kelp to get away from from having arsenic in the kelp, and it's low. That's the thing you don't realize, and I mean that's kind of what happened in Colorado is they put the cops back in charge of running the rules and mm -hmm. they're like, Oh, make it the same as a pharmaceutical. And you don't realize how low um, all those numbers are and how as much as none of us want to eat any arsenic, there's a little bit of arsenic out there in the world all around. Like yeah. there's a little bit of uranium. My house has low radon, but it's not none. Like I yeah. run a radon detector and there's a little bit of, of radon and so as humans who've evolved on this planet we have a lot of built-in um natural ability to mitigate these um toxic substances potentially 
you just you just have to find it on a ratio and so there was <clears throat> there was that moment when the new laws went into effect in Colorado I think it was three or four years ago now and a lot of people got caught lacking you know it it was interesting and some of the living soil folks in the state came out and and just said straight up oh you can't you can't make a living soil that meets the 0.3 ppm and and this is another distinction that drives me nuts people think that because the law says 0.3 ppm in flour that you have to be at 0.3 ppm in your soil and that's not the case um but in the flour right what's that that's reading the it's at ppm in the flour you're saying yeah not, that's the ppm the in the flour and the plant's not going to get a hundred percent uptake Correct. So you can have a little more. So we we allow ourselves to go to 0.6 ppm arsenic. And the federal standard for compost is 64 ppm. So we're like a 120th under federal law for but compost they in our soil. But I tell you what, as, as much as we passed in, in that era, when those laws first came down and people were freaking out, I was scared for a minute, you know. Um, I was like, oh boy, here we go again. Something else that we got to split the hair on and it's yeah. going to drive costs through the roof and this and that. And even with our North Atlantic Atlantic kelp, we were still passing on all the tests of the flower. Uh, but then we did a full analysis of all our ingredients again. And then anything, I think the North Atlantic kelp was sitting at like 13 PPMs. Mm. And and we had to go to the inland Icelandic kelp, blah blah blah. But, so your so really, it sounds like then as a big soil builder, your one of your biggest things you think about is that like your ingredients because that's pretty much the where you're going to get any of that heavy metals is the, from what you're bringing in. Are there things that you would say and that you have learned over the years? Like I don't even think about putting that in the soil because I know. You know, you know, some things maybe that the, the average home grower people out here just use on a regular basis. And you're like, yeah, I probably wouldn't be doing that. You know? Well, the ones off the top of my head are the soft rock phosphate and the with without knowing your source. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of synthetics that I wouldn't use, but <clears throat> in the natural world, there aren't a ton of things. Um you know, obviously nitrates are problematic and there there's a whole new movement of folks saying, oh, cannabis needs all this nitrate and blah, blah, blah. It's it's the way the way that it's meant to be. And I do think a little bit of nitrate's not a bad thing, but you can get all the nitrate that your plant might want from um, compost like a good compost has a little bit of nitrate in it. And I don't ever want to see my nitrate levels absolute maximum 20%. And I'm happier if I'm closer to around 10% nitrate, I want to get most of my, um, most of my nitrogen from aminos. And mm -hmm. it's the fascinating thing because in the end, that's what the plant's going to do with the nitrate anyway, is turn mm -hmm. it into amino acids. So uh, for me, starting out as aminos just make so much more sense. Boom. And that's where the JLFs for me come into play and, and those kind of things, because now you're taking those plants, breaking them down into those smallest components. One thing I'll say th that I, people are, you know, everybody's since Instagram, I guess, and all these living soils, everybody's doing the larger beds and, you know, all that. People are getting salt build up sometime now. Things like Bokashi going real heavy on those food scraps and things. Those things build up your salt. So, you know, go easy. One thing that I've incorporated into my living soil beds is a way to pump out that leachate. And I've been testing that. And you'd be surprised that leachate is hot, like fucking over the meter. Like, you know what I mean? So, um, th th and that's fine in that system. But, you know, just being able to take that out to me is key because over the long run, big worm, just we had a conversation. They had salt build up. You know what I mean? Now they're trying to flush their beds where if you go ahead and build that big bed, you get your sump in there. Now, when if you ever want to flush or get rid of some of that salt, you can kind of fill that baby up, pump it out. And then there you go. So just a little 
tidbit of what we've been learning you know what i mean as we've been i love it and what what salts are you seeing build up with bakashi well bakashi in its own if you're using and i say that if you're using the food scraps if you're taking your food waste out the kitchen doing the bokashi doing it in a bucket and then introducing that back into your soil which i what i do is put it into my soil or compost um i don't know the specific salt spark but i'll say your sodium levels are higher and they can get really high in the soil and build up over time especially like when you're running these beds and there's just a leachate tray there's no runoff it kind of never really leaves so if you continue adding if you're adding too many sea meals crab your um, kelps all those things with salt um be careful on the buildup over time and locking out different other nutrients you know yeah that's wise for sure yeah you think that also comes from the early days of when somebody starts like they're just putting too much on and so it builds up and then yeah. eventually you start to see these little almost like rings or pockets of the salt build up and then in the mm -hmm. big beds just kind of or at least for me I, like the early days it would kind of build up in the pockets so it does seem like that kind of flows somehow into a certain area and then um, uh, just gets to be too much yeah, because you always got your low spot. You know, if you're really meticulous when you build a bed, you want to. I always was meticulous on level. I was like, yeah, I want it perfectly level. But now I'm putting a slight slope on my beds and going to that low corner. That way, every my water collects there. Boom, pump out or do. I can also monitor a lot better too how much is in there. But yeah, you're right, Brian. It was like it that the pockets man and it almost seems like they grow too because now they get hydrophobic a little bit those little pockets and they get more hydrophobic and yeah yeah good point on that no and it's fascinating out here in the arid southwest like the clay around us you'll see gypsum precipitating up out of the out of the clay and growing these structures and it's exactly that it's this buildup of like calcium sulfate over a long time coming down the ditches and things like that and mm -hmm. um a lot of people here in the old days thought it was sodium but and and there is some sodium in it for sure but mostly it's just <clears throat> a crazy amount of calcium sulfate and a lot of alkaloids that that just steal the hydrogen and if you can drop the ph a little now all of a sudden all that calcium becomes bioavailable again but as the pH goes up and up and up, it just locks out and, and there's nowhere for it to go. What's a good range you, you shoot for? You're in that five, five, six, eight, where, where you at? Yeah, something like that. Like if I'm if I'm ever getting above about seven, six, then the plant root exudates can't keep up. Mm. Like those, if, if I'm below seven, six, the biology and the exudates and everything can keep going. But I hear a lot of people like, oh, you do living soil, you never need to pH. And while that's generally the case, I definitely think there are conditions, alkaline water, alkaline soil, where where you, once it gets above a certain point, the alkaloids are just going to steal that hydrogen from you faster than <clears throat> the plant or your biology can produce it. Mm, good point. Good point. Yeah, man. And this can happen in, a, yeah, right in your own living soil in the same way, you know, because, yeah, build up over time. And then what happens is you see, oh, this plant's not doing as well. You thought it, it's your prized cut. What's going on? And then, you know, then you start chasing shit. But for me, yeah, I, the larger bed you can do, the better, you know what I mean? And then increasing that biology through the addition of organic material, you know what I mean? that chop and drop, that's pretty crucial um, just to keep things in balance and not have any issues, you know? Like you said, Brian, when you learn a new thing, you you wanna, yeah, I learn this new input, I'm gonna put it on. You know, you, you want, you end up doing it more and you think because it's natural, you can just add more and more and more. But that's what I always try to show folks. That's why I brought, break out the old EC meter to show you this shit is hot. Like just because it's, it's plants and water and microbes, it, it's some hot stuff. And think about your ingredients that you're using you know yeah it'd be really interesting to see a test on that and and see what is building up there um i'd be fascinated by that if you ever get a chance to send one in 
And, yeah, uh, I need to do a little soil test. I man, I've been, I'm just been like you said, that's a hundred bucks. But I just when things ain't broke, I ain't really worrying about it. But I need to do some tests just on all the different bears and for my own, you know, knowledge and and you know, kind of research purposes on how this stuff do, doing over time. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. No, that's it. And that's that's what I find the most useful is just. Uh, watching how the soil mineral profile changes whether it's in response to plants pulling the ions out biology input um i i definitely and and it's always fascinating to me too how a master grower like you or brian has this intuitive feel how how you can kind of know what's going on there without mm -hmm. having to look at that soils test. And I, I felt it too. It's, it's something that we, we kind of get into. It's also what makes it so complicated for a novice trying to get into it. And, you know, you start out, let's say with compost, this is probably the biggest issue I see across, you know, hundreds of clients I consult for is that they'll start with some compost. They, they were, they're in a dead, low organic matter situation, not much biology. They'll add some compost and now all of a sudden they've boosted, you know, NPK, calcium, magnesium, zinc, all of these minerals. Plus they've added all this biology. The biology starts going again. They're like, wow, my whole crop and growing style has changed. They think it's sort of a miracle substance which it is but then they they double down on that and they do it again the next year and the next year and three or four or five years in a lot of these organic farms while they've built great organic matter <coughs> they're a lot of them are potassium toxic you know i'll see i'll see it was it was at denver botanic gardens chatfield farm i saw them with phos or uh sorry potassium in the in the uh 1500 ppm range and a lot of other there are a lot of detrimental effects from this potassium toxicity and so i feel like that's probably the biggest trap i see organic farmers and growers fall into is too much of a good thing you know mm -hmm. they'll they'll have an input they'll be like oh wow that changed my whole world and then they'll just be all in on that and go crazy. And it's really about moderation and getting the right amount at the right time. And that's a really hard thing to judge because you can't see it happening. Mm -hmm. like, how much is your plant taking out each harvest? I was talking to, uh, um, I just want to like highlight your point there, Bart. I was yeah. talking to a gentleman a long time ago that was kind of talking about that stuff and how like, it, if you're staying on point, you're staying focused, you're putting these things together, that it's just going to come um, kind of naturally to you. And a lot of the early stuff, um, I, I think almost sounded too good to be true. People thought that you had to spend money, spend money specifically at a, like a high end grow store, buy a certain brand of uh, nutrients to achieve these things where the old heads in the mountains were trying to teach us. I, I guess I was considered a young buck back then um foolishly that that we didn't have to spend all this money and we looking back i mean we might have had a decade of experience to be able to to gain on this and to probably have years of actually more successful harvests and perpetual harvests that were less pest pressures and if you've ever if you've ever truly bat battled like a russet mite problem it can be disheartening i mean the entire team or your your partner if you're kind of in the gray market the, the, the morale and everything just goes down dramatically. And so what I feel like you guys of teaching the newer community that especially getting into this for 2024, it's really not only how to grow these plants, but if you're starting to understand what truly the uh, secondary metabolites can offer you, then that's why the, I guess some people might still consider it bro science, but pinching the stalks and doing some stress training and getting those biceps on those girls to be a little bit stronger, uh, you know, there's debate on that kind of stuff. And so I wanted to kind of dive into that a little bit, because I do think that building up those little bubbles, those knuckles, whatever you call them, 
Uh, it stores up calcium, stores up other things. And then when she needs it late in flower, it seems like she's able to tap into that a lot quicker because it's right there instead of going into the roots. And so I wanted to ask Bart on that. And then obviously, Marco, if you could chime in on that as well. Yeah, I don't do a whole lot of that stressing, but I really do think there's potentially something to it. And I've seen some pretty crazy articles that <laughs> show some some significant um benefits to different kinds of stresses <clears throat> they just have to be done right like that's kind of an expertise you have obviously is your ability to do that without introducing pathogens into the plant and so you know i think that's the thing is if you have that expertise if someone's shown you or you've developed a technique over the years um those are amazing things to do and and that's kind of what potentially um, can set a grower over another are, are some of these techniques they've learned in a relationship with the plant. And yeah, I think, I think there's a lot to that. Yeah, I do too, man. I, I, I do some, some different things. And I think well, the way I look at it, like just say, for instance, the bending, you know, squeeze, bend, uh, you know, super cropping. You don't, you don't really, you always read there's benefit, you know, someone says, oh, this worked better, the, the tapped into the um, better, like Brian said, but you don't really, really hear anybody say it doesn't work. Like when a lot of these things that you hear the good, but you don't hear anything bad. So in my opinion, why not try them? You know what I'm saying? Um, I'm a fan of that, man. I'm a fan of the getting that um, main, those main colas to lay down and then give me more um, colas coming up on the secondaries, you know what I mean? Right up at the top um another one like you know <laughs> drought people people you dry out i used to go i used to do a lot of dry downs but when i got with the larger beds it, it, i felt like the benefit on trying to reset was not worth it for me because i like to go right i'm perpetual i go right back in and now if i dry out that bed now i got it's dry i gotta work it back up to build that moisture up i'd rather just keep that whole thing universally moist now so that's how i do with the big beds and you can mess with lights you know what i mean everybody rocks a uv they're doing that now they're getting a lot cheaper um i've always going back to the old school hps and flower metal highlight and veg but at the end i'll switch to metal highlight boom going with that blue uh, for those last 10 days or so and then another one dark you know some people go with that to the 36 hour 24 hour dark that's one that you kind of hear about i've read papers that that increases terps you know what i mean and i haven't really read that you lose much in the last day or two you know what i mean so it's one of those things that i just roll with it because it kind of makes sense um but yeah man there's a lot that stress that's how you increase the secondaries the primaries that's your environment you got your shit that's the environment soil lighting all that's humming your plants growing growing leaves you know, it's kind of your primary deal. But now when you're in the flower and you want that plant to really push that secondary, those are the turf. That's the stuff that makes it you know, stinky. Like keep, keep, keep off me. Maybe it's to keep pests away. You know what I mean? Maybe it's to attract things to pollinate it. You know, it's got all different reasons, but we want them turps. I know that much. That's it. And yeah, <laughs> so many of those secondary metabolites and that's Aaron's whole world are, they're, they're now really showing that like, plants have an active communication system to try to call in beneficials um, and and bring them to the plant. And that's the thing. If, if they're not out there in the environment or if this biology isn't in the, in the rhizosphere, then it doesn't matter how much the plant's trying to call it in with these secondary metabolites. You're, you're not going to get it. And so that's, why the synthetics are so detrimental to this whole system um and yeah i don't know it's it's so fascinating to me but i guess if i if i'm going to say one thing about my growing style it's that i'm lazy ass like whatever is the easiest to get yes. the quality that i want i'm pretty much there so I got a lot going on, man. I, I you know I don't have time to be fucking around <laughs> that's it yeah some some of these cats are are really jumping through some hoops, doing some tricky stuff. And I see some results. I see, I see people claiming right now that electroculture is this big thing that, you know, they're mm -hmm. shocking their plants with 70 volts all day or whatever like that. And while that's interesting, like 
I've got no energy for that, you know. Mm -mm. <laughs> that's that's too much setup for me right now. Oh my um, gosh, yeah. Let alone shocking yourself and stuff like that. Exactly. I thought about doing some sound things, but I you know, never really never really went that route. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I used to I used to try different. I'd play I'd play my plants, some like classical music and some hmm. primus and whatever, whatever else, you know some hip hop see yeah why not i could never determine a, a concrete result from those experiments exactly I, I always think damn i like it quiet when i'm sleeping so let me um let me keep it quiet for the ladies too <laughs> there you go i like that thinking and they have some of those weird frou-frou plant sound machine things have you ever used any of those no, don't see that's that snake oil <laughs> stuff, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the guy that does it's probably bullshit, it works. Here's my paper, you know. But yeah, he's yeah. probably in the chat right now. Right. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, but um, there's a lot of stuff that you know that you know, everybody tries a little bit of everything. I remember, man, I remember that like to this day, I still cannot get over this like people used to like stick a pen through the stalk you know what i mean like a needle or stuff like that to me i was like that's just ridiculous that's just kind of introducing a chance for pathogens or something you know what i'm saying exactly. why would you do that sure. like you yeah know I mean? weird it seems a little wacky to me yeah but i mean for me man sticking with that environment giving them a loving soil that they can just get everything they need. And you said something key, because a lot of the salt growers try to say, oh, a plant doesn't care where it got its nutrients. But you said something key, and you said you don't allow the plant to have anything else. So the plant can't even have a chance to eat something else, which may let it express another way. You feel me? Like, that's where the salt guys, I think, I mean, that's where they're going wrong, but they're growing fire. But I always think, damn, if you only grew that in living soil, it'd be even better. You know, that's how I always look at it. There you go. And and I can say fairly depend definitively now that um, against most of the salts, the terp profiles of our customers are <clears throat> across the board better in living soil than they are in salts. Yeah, every guest says that. Everyone says that. Like yeah, everyone we, says that. We lost a customer, a really big company recently. I'm not gonna say who, but they had switched back to salts for a while and their lead grower attributed their downslide to their attempt to go go back to the salt method. Why though? What 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 were they cost benefit analysis on that? The bean counters, you know, they the bean counters always get in and they'll look at the price of salts and they'll look at what people are paying for living soil and their amendments and this and that. Mm. And, and then they don't look at the quality of the product and they don't mm -hmm. look at the labor and they don't look at the resistance to pests and pathogens and all this immune function and the viruses and the, you know, on and on and on and on. I, there was, there was a year when was, when was the last big hemp year before the hemp apocalypse? It's probably like four years ago or something. I thought it was like 2015, 2016. Something like was it that people, far back? Well, when they were talking about, uh, oh, I got a million pounds of uh, of materials, how they would always yeah. say it. Bio, yeah. Biomass. Mm -hmm. Biomass. There Bio you go. Yeah. yeah. So there was there was one of those years. And we had some clients out here who were doing doing living soil and with cover crops and all the, the heady stuff. And then all along the I-70 corridor were these folks doing Oregon CBD and there was some other darling consultancy locally that everybody was into and um, they were doing a salt-based regimen and the uh, beet curly top virus came in and it was carried by leaf hoppers and all of those salt, plastic mulched, all that bullshit farms had mortality rates of 90 percent or more like a, a lot of those farms were just wiped out they didn't get any crop out of it that year from the beet curly top and of our clients running in organic living soil the most infection rate we ever saw was 30 percent and even with that infection rate those plants were like you know like me they had a cold but they're like well we know what to do with that we're gonna readjust and 
kick that virus's ass out. And, uh, and, and those plants got better and, and were completely in general, completely resistant to beat curly top. And to me, that was the most in my face, real world situation where I saw plant viruses <clears throat> go from completely devastating a crop to not even being able to hang on at all. Is that one when it affects cannabis that's very visible right away, or is it one that kind of slowly gets you? Because I'm just curious how, like, I feel like whenever these big farms, are they being, are people paying enough attention? Are they seeing shit that's quick enough? Is the right person seeing things? Is the owner they too should. far away? You know? No, and, and, you know, for all of us, like, that one caught me lacking a bit because I had okay. never seen that pathogen before. And certainly what does it look not, like? Certainly not in hemp. Like the some places on the leaves just start twisting and curling, getting brown, um, tissue going necrotic. It 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 was its own kind of thing for sure. And it took me probably like a month to figure out what was really going on. Okay. And it was fast enough moving that in a month's time, most of those farms were done out the game. Fortunately for me, the the living soil carried us and saved saved my buddy's crops and the other folks that were our clients' crops because um did they I, grow they grow on through it? The, 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 your, oh yeah, no, they, they kept it going and okay. you know the plants that were hit the worst, maybe some of the 30 percenters, <laughs> as I was starting to suspect a virus, I was like put a bag over that thing and chop it down and burn it, you know? And so they did that to some of those plants, but in general, they, they yielded a harvest of over 90% in both of those grows. And, um, in a year when, when a lot of people went out of business because of that peak curly top, mm. that was, that was the end, I would say of dozens of farms on the West slope was, was that viral pathogen and you see it in napa in the wine grapes like <clears throat> they they're suffering enormously from red blotch virus and you know beet curly top tomato curly top tmv like tmv such a big boogie tobacco mosaic virus such a boogie mm -hmm. man and in, in cannabis you know and 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 some people say oh it doesn't in fact this that the other well, it's it's really so much about the plant's healthy immune functioning, um, and and that is based on metabolites, typically primary metabolites, but secondary metabolites have a huge role in in immune function as well. So um, you know, it's and and then direct effects of secondary metabolites on pests and pathogens. Mm -hmm. Living soil for the wind, man. Exactly. It amazes me the people that like people out. You're outdoors, so you got the blessings of, of the earth, and then you still go with a salt regime. You know what I mean? A nutrient line. You know what I mean? That's just, wow. Well, that's it, and and it's so interesting how that's human nature, though, isn't it? Like, yeah. Every all the time, I see people wanting to think that this magic thing that's their silver bullet, like they were so smart and they figured out the the thing that nobody else figured out and so they're gonna do whatever weird shit and yep. and really like nature spent hundreds of millions if not more years <coughs> adapting to these environmental stresses and conditions and so for my money i'll always bet on nature and i'll always try to use those nano mechanisms built into nature to do my work if I can. <clears throat> and so, yeah, it's, it's foreign to me to think that, you know, somehow, and, and it was so crazy how after world war two, the chem companies and all the agronomists were like, Oh, all you need is NPK. And we know so much more than that now, but for pretty much from like the late forties to the mid sixties, other than Albrecht, you know, and they tried to suppress him as much as they could. Like mainstream agronomy was like, all we need is N, P, and K. They didn't even care about calcium, magnesium, zinc, 
blah, 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 boron, you know, and that's boron's another fascinating one to me. I was looking at this little bit here, like boron is, is super critical for the plant to produce vitamin C and glutathione. And those are, those are both key components of plant immunology. And, and so without trace minerals like that, you're not going to have a healthy plant. And if it, if you're so deficient in that, uh, it really doesn't matter what else you do. You have to get boron from somewhere and to some degree you can get it from biology, but I would really say boron is probably the, the most critical element that, that you need for plant immune function. That's a good point, Barb, because I um I just pulled up my notes. I had a thing I was putting together. It was like last year. I didn't finish it, but I was doing the, all the micronutrients. Boron is at the first one on my list um, because I feel like those micronutrients, boron, iron, copper, zinc, molybdenum, chlorine, uh, uh, manganese, nickel, uh, cobalt, silicon, selenium. Like to me, those micros, to me, those go right on a, hand in hand with your with your turch. You know what I mean? With those micro uh, secondary metabolites, you know, having those available in the soil as well. Uh, For sure. Proper ratios, obviously. A thousand percent. And another cool um, subderivative of boron is calcium pectate. Boron drives the formation of calcium pectate in the plant. Mm. And that's probably one of the most critical compounds for cell cell wall strength. <coughs> um, and that mm. drives a ton of fungal pathogen resistance. Um, they can't really use their enzymes as well. Uh, and so, um, you know, when, when you look at some of these intricate chemical interactions happening in the plant cell biology, you really, you really get to the base of why these minerals are so important, but, um, yeah, boron driving calcium pectate is, is one to look into for folks who want to go down a rabbit hole that, uh, that's its own whole world. And it's one of the things that nitrates kind of mess with you with too, you know, nitrate use causes cell stretching and boron stripping. Mm. And so this is why folks that run a lot of nitrates often, you know, they're, they're with less boron, then you're not producing the calcium pectate with the cell stretching. Now the cell walls thinner, um, the silica component, once again, the more silica you can get into the cell wall, mm -hmm just the harder and thicker and more resistant to a fungal pathogen or an insect pathogen penetrating that cell wall. And, and even then the production of those secondary metabolites <clears throat> will often make the plant less appealing. Like they'll make the juice in the cell taste bad to different insects. And, mm -hmm. and that's almost completely the role of secondary metabolites. So, you know, that whole that whole world is fascinating to me how plants adapt in that way and how how they can trigger off of enzymes in certain insects mouths and then know how to resist that insect and they'll change their chemistry specifically for that insect <laughs> pest or something like that so yeah it's it's very circular and very complex way way more complex than my mind can even start yeah. to wrap wrap around definitely so that's why i wanted to do some i do a simple so like i took that note and you know you can find boron and leafy greens like kale and spinach also can be found in grains prunes raisins and non-citrus fruits and nuts so for the natural farming guys those are things you can use and make those uh, special jls you know what i mean and he said uh nuts was one of the main ones that's where i go with the acorn you know what I mean? So nice. we got ways to increase those, uh, you know, in, in a natural way. You know what I mean? That's really cool. cool. Yeah, I, I've kind of wondered what what inputs might be the highest in boron. So that's gold right there. 
Yeah, you know, and it's and, and it's for your body too. You know, think when you're thinking when you're learning these plant nutrients and all these, and think about your own body because our own body needs all these things. I got my physical the other day, and doctor was like, "Your potassium's high. That's a good thing." So I was like, "All right, cool." It made me think about my plants. So I was like, "Oh, potassium." You know, I mean, so, but you don't realize that's actually a function of the human body too. You know what I mean? So we all know that, but just to keep that in our mind too while we're growing. There you go. Magnesium and potassium, most human beings are lacking in plants yeah. when they are. You see the deficiencies. Yeah. Bart, I mean, for, pe for people that don't know, I mean, we didn't give enough, I guess, of a background, but you're making soil on a grand scale. You have quite an impressive company. You have employees, all of the things, you know, kind of on that medium level to upper tier of being an entrepreneur. And so you see so many different things. And I was hoping that you could understand kind of enlighten us on if I'm new to this and I'm trying to use mother nature, but I want to learn how to improve on mother nature, kind of like we're talking about with uh, at least growing healthy plants. And then from that point on, what amendments do you feel like would really make a difference? Uh, is there a specific uh, amendment that you feel like uh, help maybe for, for example, to try to give you an example where people feel like it's an easy one to add. If you're using a quality one, there's enough, uh, um, 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 trace minerals in there to actually make a difference. Yeah. I mean, I love kelp and, and that's the thing about my soil is it was, it was really easy back in the day when I was coming up with the first recipes and formulation to want to throw everything in the kitchen sink in there. <clears throat> and I had to do some, some science of my own to really determine, um, what is critical and <clears throat> what drives a measurable result and it's been it's been a little interesting to watch how we've adapted that over the years we don't make many changes but um but when we do we do them very slowly and we've got 22 ingredients in our potting mixes and a lot of people think i'm crazy especially other people in the business um you know, you talk somebody, you call somebody to talk about a mix line or something with 22 ingredients, and they've never even heard of that. Uh, and so everything that's in our soil and that list is, it's actually probably on that label right behind you, Brian, but um, every single thing on that list, I feel like drives a measurable impact or result. But I would say at the top, you know, obviously, out, out here in arid Colorado, if there are two things I can do that's that are two inputs that I can give somebody that are going to drive a measurable result, it's probably like feather meal and citric acid because everything's so alkaline and everyone's nitrogen deficient. And if you're nitrogen deficient, you're not going to get anywhere. And especially with a plant like cannabis, it is so hungry to eat nitrogen that that is a huge, um, a huge stopping place right there. That's, that's going to be your bottleneck, especially obviously in veg, <laughs> you know? And so, so without a good amino nitrogen source, you're kind of dead in the water. And so I really like feather meal. I think feather meal is great. It's a waste product. It's half soluble, half keratin. I think people underestimate the value of keratin um, it's a really long burn long time release form of amino nitrogen <laughs> it's a super complex folded protein it takes a lot to make it available to the plant i mean just think of hair and hooves and fingernails and junk like that <clears throat> like that stuff lasts a long time you know um, do an experiment, cut off some hair and put it out in your yard and see how long it takes for that to break down buried in a little hole in the soil. It will take a long time. And so um, keratin is one of my favorite forms of non-soluble amino nitrogen. Um, and then, then after that, you know, you start getting into obviously balancing N, P, and K. And like kelp does have a lot of great trace minerals. Kelp has some plant growth hormones that are really cool. Um, natural plant growth hormones. 
but it's also very high in potassium. So you've got to watch out. I see a lot of people running a lot of compost and kelp together, and that that can be a train wreck. So don't overdo it on the kelp. And a lot of people think that they're like actively aerated compost teas are going to grow more culture, more biology with kelp. And that is also not the case. Like some of those early tea recipes with the soluble kelp in them really don't test out very good under the scope. <clears throat> so, um, you know, uh, and, and then next, I, I guess I would say, I really love that uh, fish bone meal. It's a great source of both uh, non-soluble amino nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, and then, you know, uh, probably fossilized seabird guano next. And then you can't forget the whole CalMag component. Um, I'm always trying to achieve like a, a uh, five to one calcium to magnesium ratio. And so our CalMag component is a combination of dolomite lime, uh, oyster shell flour, gypsum, and sometimes calcitic lime, <clears throat> just depending on where we are in those ratios. And I'm always trying to balance that. And that's why Albrecht's ratios are so important. Is It's kind of the same thing as with the salts. If the plant wants to drink, it has to eat. Now we're going a layer deeper and saying, okay, the plant plant now has control of how much it wants to eat, but it has a hard time picking apart all the elements that are there in the soil. It just kind of has to eat the soil unless it has microbes in between. And so in that, the more you can get the ions into ratio, the more happy the plant is, you know, it's like, oh, it's not a whole meal of just sauce. There's some pasta to go with it too, you know, that kind of thinking. Yeah, Jeff Longfellow's kind of brought that into light in the early days about thinking of it as like a meal where the microbes would kind of communicate with the plant. Hey, we need more tonight. We need uh, burgers because we do need more protein. And then the next night, hey, we actually need more vitamins and minerals. Let's have a salad. And I think that started to click for a lot of people that weren't necessarily understanding some of the higher level talks of cannabis, especially at some of these earlier expos. But when you did start to comprehend that, and that's why I always try to give credit to Jeff, is he always spoke to the growers in a way that we could try to understand it, not speak over the room so that everybody knew how smart he was. I mean, the guy oh, went sure. to Harvard, you know? I mean, graduated yeah. from Harvard. So he probably could dial it, dial it up if he wanted to. But to be able to understand a topic in the way that, you know, there's so many people now that understand it. But he was definitely one of the first ones that was not only writing books about it, but was being at the cannabis shows and not being afraid to be at the cannabis shows. I mean, some of the other early pioneers didn't want anything to do with cannabis. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. He embraced you, us. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, all everybody's big hugs. You know, you can certain people didn't even want you to say the word cannabis at their at their uh, classes and stuff. So it's yeah. come a long way. Um, and I think there's something too when you, kind of follow uh, Jeff's teachings if you're really new to this and you don't really understand what's going on. And then there's so many different videos out there. I mean, Marco walks you through a lot of that stuff even on Instagram. So there's there's tons of information where you can kind of catch up in just a few years and you're going to make, a, in my opinion, a, a drastic difference to your grows when you start to understand on a deeper and deeper level how important secondary metabolites are. And I think you'll understand why... Uh, a lot of people are into LEDs now so that you don't have to buy the um, what were the the mini the mini splits. So when we ran the uh, double enders back in the day, it was so fucking hot. Then you had to spend another probably five thousand dollars in this year getting a kind of a cheap one uh, to buy this thing called a mini split so that you could cool down the rooms and keep up with those double enders. So mm -hmm. you're spending so much money to supposedly find these terps that everybody was after and pheno hunting and. Looking back, I think it was, uh, you know, we were at the circus. We were clowning ourselves thinking that we were going to be able to find something running systems in this manner. And so there's something to what we're talking about today. If you've already built out a room, is all right, now I need to dial in my environment. Mm -hmm. It's just as important. I know we say that all the time, but now I think more people will start to understand why. You know, it's the same thing when you, you need to eat healthier. Well, everybody hears that shit until one day. You know, you uh, for me, it was I got this thing called trigger finger where I couldn't move my finger anymore. And I started to realize that 
uh, my mortality was starting to creep in. And so I better change my ways and try to understand how to fix these things naturally, or I'm going to be on pain pills the rest of my life. And I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So there you go. That's good, man. Busting that gun too much with a young huh? <laughs> it had nothing to do with that, but it does lock up like this. Yeah. Okay. I'm just messing with you. Um, yeah, yeah. Feather mill, Bart. I'm intrigued. I, I do use a little feather mill, but um, I broke that, took off, stuck that back to just say feathers. Like, how long are, is it? How how long if we? How long does feather mill take to break down? Because I always said the mills break down a lot quicker. But feather with it having that um, like tougher component to it, it probably lasts a lot longer in the soil. What, what's your experience on that? Oh, yeah, for sure. Actual feathers take pretty much forever to break down. And okay. it's it's only folks that have this really high level of biology, particularly fungal organisms, that can, that can bioprocess that keratin effectively without giving the biology more surface area and that's what you're doing when you grind it down is you're you're just creating smaller particles and so more of the surface is exposed to the biology and that biological activity and so yeah it's a it's certainly a way to put the brakes on the nitrogen <clears throat> and if you have a lot of feathers use them you know they certainly don't have to be ground and all you're going to be doing is creating a longer time release amino nitrogen source um interestingly enough there is all, still that soluble component in there <clears throat> and it was always more than i expected like the fact that that feathers are half soluble nitrogen feels a little crazy to me but that's that's what's in there and so nice. yeah it's it's a whole game but you're absolutely right the more you grind it the more bioavailable the more quick release it's going to be okay okay so you can kind of tailor that when you're building your custom soil for yourself you know if you got chickens you can kind of you had enough you plucked a few maybe meat birds or whatever yeah grind them up put them in there or a little bit slower release type deal i bet the microbes really jump on those feathers too on that microscopic leather level tearing up that uh that that um that soluble le uh, component in there yeah, the bacteria that can bioprocess soluble nitrogen love that, and they go nuts with it. The fungals get on there and try to get to work, but boy, it's a long, slow process for them. That stuff is so tough, and it's crazy to me to see nature making something. And, and it's really the complexity of the folding of the protein that's what gives keratin its mm. resilience to decomposition. And, and there's not a lot in nature that's that way. Mm hmm. Yes, yeah, sir. I feel like maybe some of these folks with these sheep's wool pellets might be on to a track. I haven't tried any of them out yet, but yeah, we talked about that. Uh, who was that? Tell we were talking about using sheep's wool. I can't remember now one of our guests, but that's a great idea, too. You remember, Brian? wasn't that that Ray? Or we were talking about some of that stuff with Ray. Uh, I forget his last name, but he does like oh, yeah, and... yes. Yeah, we, we hit on with Ray and then Ray Kadronic. Yeah, however you say it. The Ray. I know I don't know the name of Ray, but that, that's that's not know. even his name. I learned too. Like, oh, it ain't. <laughs> yeah, that's just like you know street name. I like that. <laughs> yeah. So shout out to Ray. Good yeah, news. Appreciate good, you, Ray. Good old Ray. Yeah, man. Um, oh, going back to um, I liked your example of that um, tree growing on the rock um uh bart when, when last little road trip i took with my wife i pointed up there i was like you see that tree growing up there on that rock i said that's what i'm going for with my that's what my soil is all about like she doesn't care but i gotta i had to say it because it was in the moment so that's what my soil is all about you know that's what that horizon is about it's mimicking that rock on a small level breaking down eventually and i saw something recently that there's a bacteria um, that's that, that's responsible for um, helping break down that rock, and it does it like 500 times faster than like just weathering alone. So with bacteria, with root and rock, it's breaking down really fast over time. Slowly breaking down, chop and drop, aka leaves fall, build it up. Next thing you know, on this rock, you got a little bit of soil, and you got a foot of soil, and you got you know. So that's kind of how the the whole thing. The mindset of that uh you know horizon or the way i look at it man it's kind of 
incorporating that kind of aspect. So that's, that's cool exactly. as shit though when you see that. Yeah, it's fascinating how all that works. And it is so wild. And it was, I guess it was probably at Telluride Mushroom Fest like 12 years ago or 13 years ago. I was listening to a talk by Paul Stamets and he really changed my mind around that. He was talking about these islands um, up off the coast of BC where they had deforested them, you know, logged them all out and they could never get trees to grow there again. And they, they couldn't figure it out. They tried every kind of fertilizer and this, that, and the other, and they just couldn't make it happen. There wasn't enough soil to make it work. And, uh, and he came in, he was researching um, mycorrhizal organisms at the time. And uh, he was able to completely reforest those islands using mycorrhizal organisms and you know, obviously not bacterial, but um, they were able, and that's where he really showed that the enzymes from the mycorrhizal fungal organisms, and and those are more um, ectos than endos on trees. They don't really penetrate the cell wall the same way. They just kind of do an external handoff, but they are able to go out with enzymes, break down some of that rock and bring it back and, and utilize it to feed the plant. And those processes are so, so cool, so complex, yet they're just happening automatically if you don't kill all your biology. Automatically. That's the key. It just happens. That's it. I mean, I, I love having an army of a billion, trillion, jillion little worker bots out there in my compost pile doing it for me. And yeah. the more the more species you can deploy, the the cooler it is because the more tricky stuff you can do and, yep. and lo and behold, you didn't have to go figure out all those species as an inoculant in a grocery store or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're, they're out there in nature. And if you create the conditions, then they're going to, they're going to do the work for you. Yeah, man. My last soil bill, Bart, just to bring, just to finish that point, I, I do three parts. I left each part on the ground, like outdoors, like, and I, and I did that on purpose. And then I put it together and I built my soil, mended it, put it inside, you know, my indoor. Yeah, That's I it. got a hell of a fungus gnat thing popped off, of course. That's normal, but I got that knocked out with the BTI and row beetles and the things are balancing itself out. But the amount of different diversity in my this soil compared to any other is crazy. Like the number of mites, just fast moving native mites in there are just is just crazy, man. Like it's just you can't beat that, you know, getting that outdoor natural nature to me and putting it in the, into your soil. Like the diversity is key, you know. So that's, that's it. Cool. And it's so funny after all the years of you know, oh, you got to sterilize this, sterilize that. <clears throat> like that was the the plant uh, agronomy that I was kind of raised on was, was that you had to sterilize your media. And looking back now, I still have people all the time come to me and <laughs> they, they want to take my living soil and sterilize it. And I'm like, I don't think you want to do that. And and yet it was so pervasive. And that's that's the thing. Once again, it keeps coming back around. If you're going to play God and you want to choose all the salt nutrients, then you'd better get it exactly right. And now you have to get all the everything else right for the elimination of pests and pathogens. Whereas working like you are there where you're laying it down on the ground and culturing out all that natural species diversity what a better way. And do you ever rock the uh, Steiner Nema, Feltier Nema toads or? Yeah, yeah, I have. I, I used to get those. Um, I haven't got them lately. I usually only, you know, I don't know. I kind of went away because I get a lot of nematodes in my deal because I use compost that I make, you know, and I use my soil, you know, gets inoculated on the ground. But um, so I really haven't added a lot of nematodes lately. Do you think that's beneficial, even though you feel like it's good or you can't go wrong with too many since they're predatory nematodes and all? Well, I mean, obviously, we certainly don't want any plant pathogenic nematodes, but 
mm-hmm. for me doing what I do on scale, it's one of the things that I think we do different than most folks is yeah, in our compost piles, we're inoculating billions of of Steinernema and Hypoaspis mele. And I'm kind of interested <coughs> to see some of these new, um, there, there's some new nematodes that are really advanced at thrip control. Um, mm. And so uh, de- depending on what we've got going on, my baseline level that I rock in a commercial operation to keep, keep fungus gnats at bay is uh is Steiner Nema Feltia and the okay. Stradio Stradio Lelap Simitis mite. And so we sprinkle those out quite a bit. And then I also like Californicus mites. I like um, Californicus. I think I think Californicus the yeah. Pardon. Yeah. The hyperma- hyperapsis miles, they're they're key too. There you go. Yep. Soil and, dwellers. And so um like it's one of my recommendations for novice growers is before they start on anything indoors. I, I tell them to put Californicus mites in mm. and I build them right in. Yeah. You kind of got to start with those. They're, they're not as voracious as some of the other spider mite predators, mm-hmm. but they're such generalists and they don't die. If there's not food for them, they can survive just eating a little pollen here, there, whatever, like they're really hardy and they'll get by. And then when that spider mite does vector in or that russet mite <laughs> or that broad mite, you know, they're like, Oh, okay. And there's enough of them that they're, they're going to dominate. And so I really think there is something to that kind of preloading, like, Spider mites are probably the biggest one here in Colorado. Mm-hmm. We've we've seen hemp russet mites, um, but it'll it was it was more like dumb growers went to Denver and got cuts and didn't know what they were doing and came back and then grew those out and made a ton of other cuts and infected everybody's starts in the whole valley with hemp russet mites and then now the whole valley's got hemp russet mites or something like that Mm -hmm. and and once they got kind of kind of a bad reputation for that kind of game and they quit doing it the hemp russet mite problem has gone away and do you all know about the whole like nixon hemp russet mite association like that they they released the government released the hemp russet mite to fuck with cannabis and yeah, all that whole they, war of drug shit. Yeah, exactly. There was a whole big That's what I feel. culture out more hemp russet mite. Not like they didn't exist to begin with, but <clears throat> that was I feel like where hemp russet mite really got its toehold was the Nixon administration yeah. putting that out to try to mess up the bad weed growers. Yeah. I believe that 100 and the end they can make one a little bit stronger when they put it out. <laughs> you know what I mean? They can, they can breed a stronger version. They even fuck with us harder. So that's it. That's it. So yeah, who knows what all went on back then, but that's one that I've seen in several historical documents that seems like it really happened. And mm-hmm. <clears throat> what a crazy thing that is. But really since that big outbreak from all those cuts, we haven't seen like massive outbreaks in this valley like that since mm-hmm. yeah i believe that man i like i'm that's a gold bar um because i usually build my soil i water in bti and I, later i'll just say I, if i'll add mites if, if i you know as needed but i like that idea of building that right on in uh let's get on get it over with get them in the soil and head off shit early do it like the big dogs do on, on the commercial scale why not you know i mean we can actually do that easier as a home grower because it doesn't cost as much <laughs> you know i don't know what your mite bill looks like bart but i know you gotta go you know in the pocketbook when you start uh, ordering shit in well that's it and we do order in bulk so we're able to get you know several many 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 billion um mites for maybe 400 bucks or something like okay. that and and we'll do that 
probably five or six times a season we'll re-inoculate all of our outdoor piles with Steiner Nema. What does that what does that look like? A big bucket of um <laughs> substrate? Like what is what does that look like when you get your mite order for one? No, it's crazy. It's it looks like a little thing of cheese this big. Okay. It's, it's amazing how small they are. And there'll be like five or six squares about that big with the weird cellulose in it. And you, you gotta dissolve them out in water and then pour yep. them in. So we'll set set one of our employees up with the backpack sprayer and and they'll get out there and work at injecting them all throughout different places in the piles. And even I like to to do them near our core processing area. You know, you'll always have some core like spilling and blowing in the wind. And I feel like that raw core with nothing else in it, it's it's the same thing. All this it's kind of this nature abhors a vacuum. And that's the the places that are the most sterile are often the places you're going to see pest and pathogen problems because there's not a whole culture of species diversity out competing the pests and pathogens. And so like any place that we've got core collecting between the cracks and stuff, I'll always spray some of the nematodes and some of the, some of the hypoaspis in there, sprinkle some of them in there too, just to make sure we've filled that void with something that, doesn't like the bad guys mm -hmm. and then on your sprayer you know it's not about the brand but what kind of sprayer should people look for so that they're not damaging the uh the nematodes you know from high pressure and stuff like that strangely the nematodes seem to be able to handle almost any pressure really okay yeah it's the fungal organisms that really Correct. don't seem to do well with centrifugal pumps and things mm -hmm. like that um high pressure stuff keep it low pressure if you can right if you can fun. keeping it low pressure but yeah i i take the nozzle off our sprayers when we use them for that we're mm -hmm. not really trying to get a spray we're basically just injecting them right below the surface of the of the compost and that seems to get me the best survivability rate of of that inoculant what does he do? Just kind of blasting it down in there to where it's going up under? Or are you saying you just yeah, wet it? No, it's he's just, a couple inches? The, the person doing that's just walking along and just putting it in and giving it a little a squirt and then another place and a squirt and another place and a squirt and another place and a squirt. And it's a fairly labor intensive process, but we only yeah. do it, you know, that five times a year or whatever. So not that big of a deal, but. And y'all come knows? back and turn it yeah um well not we usually turn it right before we do the nematodes okay. um, and uh yeah it's a it's it's an interesting important part of the process and someday i might make a special machine to do that because if i spray them on the outside i really feel like the sun kind of beats them up too much mm -hmm. and if you go too deep with them everything goes anaerobic and they don't seem happy there either so Mm. um you know it i i like that kind of surface and i i really like using um aerated static pile methodology with blowers um, that really helps me keep my aerobic species diversity alive and if you're not going to go aerobic then you have to dominate the environment with something like lactobacillus you know, which will outcompete almost everything, including the anaerobes. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty into just normally mostly keeping it aerobic and <clears throat> keeping that high species diversity. And I feel like that's one of the issues with kind of the whole EM1 labs, this, that, or the other is while there's some, some measurable results you can get from that, you are going to reduce your species diversity mm -hmm. because that is such an aggressive organism. So, Very. you know, it's, it's a trade here or there, but I really like using lactobacillus like to prevent something like powdery mildew or something like that more mm -hmm. than just as a general purpose soil inoculant. I'm the same way. I rarely use it. You almost need like a, to make yourself a little, uh, drag uh sprayer where he can kind of drag it'll drag through there down in there about a couple inches that's there pretty you go. cool now have you ever thought about when you're blowing well let me back up 
blowing sounds like that's a more cost effective way too right instead of running equipment breakdowns diesel fuel oh my turning, gosh yes right? these these guys running the turner three times a day <laughs> i don't even know how they stay in business like Man. that shit is crazy dude thank you <clears throat> you know it's you've got bearings and this and that and they're getting eaten by the the nitrates and mm. rusting and then you've got all your fuel costs and then you got to put a guy in the cab of that thing or a lady and have them drive it all day long. And it just, to me, the, there is no comparison in the cost effective aspect of moving the air versus moving all the compost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I feel like home, home compost makers miss out on it. Um, they, they often use these green barrel thingies and this, that, and the other thinking they got to move the compost. And instead, you know, there's blowers all over in waste electronics everywhere. <clears throat> um, I saw a really good article on a guy that made farm scale aerated static pile systems from old swamp coolers, for instance. Mm. Um, I see blowers in the junkyard all the time and like little wall furnaces and things like that. They have perfect little teensy tiny blowers. Leaf blowers are cheap. <laughs> a now. leaf blower can do it. Um, you know, these are these are all. Yeah, think of all the thrift stores where you can grab a leaf blower, um, and that's mm. a leaf blower is a really high pressure blower. You can you can really shove some air. So I think there's a lot to be said for making a ring of some, you know, <laughs> drainage pipe if you want to be cheap. You know that black yeah. drainage pipe that you can get at Home Depot that has a sock on it. Um, that stuff works really well and you just make a ring with a T, <clears throat> hook your blower up to the T in the ring and pressurize that ring. And the, the biggest thing is when you're, it, it, this is actually why I kind of don't like just the straight black perforated pipe <clears throat> is it typically has too many holes in it. And so mm. you have to, you have to Balance size that. your, yeah, you've got to leave some back pressure against the mm -hmm. system to get even outlet across the whole pipe system. So don't drill too many or too big a holes right away in your pipe. And the sock kind of helps with keeping that back pressure going if you're going to use that pipe. Mm -hmm. Gets Otherwise, wet a little bit and it kind of moist. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Like so, that. Damn, you just blew my mind with the um, circle. My, my, the whole time, every time you've ever said that we talked about the blower method, I always think linear. It's just a long, like, but the fucking circle for the home grower. Boom, boom. Yeah, and then Structure. you just make a little pile on it. And, of course, yeah. we do all the, the linear pipes in our operation. Okay, so you are long. Yeah, you're long and linear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and we need to come yank those back out with a big machine or something like that. And you can't uh. really do that with the with the circle, but... For the average home grower that would be filling, you know, one of those 50 or 100 gallon green bins, if instead you just maybe get some pallets, make a little boxed in zone and put a put a ring, a perf pipe underneath it. Mm -hmm. um, that's a super simple put your put your timer on your blower 15 minutes a day and make a little doghouse for it to keep it. Oh, is that all you need to run 15 a day? Yeah, that's that's what all the studies at the university show is okay. that after about eight hours, you're going to go anaerobic. Um, you know, the, the biology's used up the oxygen. And so that's a good rule of thumb is just three times a day, 15 minutes, three times a day, 15. Okay. Cool. Yep. And, and once again, how simple is that? And then the other big advantage that a lot of the, the gets lost on a lot of the windrow Turner compost operations is that they're beating the bejesus out of their fungal species. You know, the bacteria don't care. They're like, beat me harder, daddy, but they'll survive. <clears throat> but the, uh, the fungals, they, right. they do not like that. Like you go kick mushrooms in the forest and they're dead. They're done. And the mycelial networks, you kick them and they're done. That's it. That's the end of that. And, and so spores are really the only phase of biology that, uh, survive and sur survive this intense physical agitation. 
And so it's why even the green tumblers, I think, are less than optimal and why people sometimes have problems with compost is that they're making an all bacterial compost where the blower allows you to just leave the pile static and there's nothing so satisfying as rocking up in the front end loader and taking that first scoop out of a pile that you've been culturing out for six or eight months and just seeing mm. <coughs> fungal hyphae, you know, as thick as your thumb, just and that smell. Oh mm. man, it's so good. Petrichor kind of smell <laughs> or whatever. And yeah, just seeing that running through the pile. That's, that's what sold me on leaving the pile as static as you can. Now, now I want to um, do the. Now I want to blow and then add um, spores. Blow more spores right in there. Yeah, yeah my friends, my friends in Cali. It's how they introduce me. They're like, "This is Bart. He blows microbes for a living." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. What a way to be introduced. Right. Hey, I wanted to, I wanted to uh, kind of selfishly have a highlight because. Uh, People don't understand why this is so good. And I hope people can see the whiteness that's in this soil. So do you mind sharing, Bart, why this happens and why some people call mm. this uh, mold and get terrified and are afraid of a product that maybe they just don't understand? There yeah, you go. Send me that. Y'all don't want that. Give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Well, and, and those are those fungal organisms. And we got so used to, and, you know, I read the grower's guide 30 years ago and bless his heart. Ed was on to a lot of right stuff, you know, like what a genius and so far ahead of his time, but I don't think he really understood the importance of fungal species diversity. And these fungal organisms are so specific and adapted to what they're going to do. Um, everybody got kind of gun shy. Oh, if there's anything that is a fungal species, it must be trying to eat my plant. And it's just not the case. Like that, that's a very tiny percentage of all the fungal species out there are fungal plant pathogens. And, and so some of, some of the other beneficial fungal species will actually proactively attack your pathogenic species but let's let's say they don't even if they don't at the very least they're in there using up the food resources that that plant pathogen would use that its spore would use on landing to get its start and start growing fruiting bodies start growing mycelium and if some other mycelium's already been there and used up all those resources then it lands and it's like ah i got nothing and so that is is so critical and it's once again filling filling the void nature abhors a vacuum you know fill it up with the good stuff and so that's why you want to see those fungals culturing out like that is that is that they're gonna they're gonna fill the void and it's so much better to fill the void with something that you want than to just play the game of whack-a-mole of trying to keep it empty and sterile. And, and that's in my experience, I don't know why that is, but, but if the, if the, the void is empty, if the vacuum is there, <clears throat> it's almost always something I don't want that's going to yeah. fill it up for me. And I, and I don't understand that, but, but it's interesting that that's what happens. So yeah, oh, I would, man, I say that's my take on it. The bad guys are punks, man. <laughs> And they and, and punks proliferate until the tough guys come around. There you and once go. the tough guys get there, the punks don't come back. Because it's like, all right, we're you know, they did their little thing and they're gone. So Boom. yeah, man, that that's so that's key. I love that, man. I had a um gardening friend, she sent me a photo of some, you know, mycelium in her um, she was digging her flowers. Oh my god, what is this? I said, that's the good stuff, you know, that's the stuff that's that decomposition going on. It's not eating your plants, like you said, Bart. So to have that coming right out the bag, that's just, that's wonderful right there. That tells you right there how good that, you know, that soil is. That's what we're shooting for. That's for sure. And it's nice when it happens like that. Do you remember that guy, Brian, I showed you his picture? He had like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like... You're, there was a guy on uh, on here that was showing off like um, almost like a tote full. Yeah, uh, he had two stuff. totes and he stuck them in his barn. 
and covered him up. We, we gave him to him sponsorship for his grow. <clears throat> and, uh, was it like something dogs, dogs days. There's something with the like dog. That. I remember, but it was a dog with a Z in it. And yeah, he, he left it in his barn and opened it up a while later. And he was like, Holy shit. Yeah. Crushing. There was, like there was that. probably 10 species of mycelial fruiting bodies going nuts under, under the top of that. Nice. There's not really too many people in a bagged bag soil world where they see this. And so that also scares cannabis farmers uh, that aren't necessarily hip to what's actually going on in this kind of stuff. And so I've been teaching people to more or less read labels. And in the new world that I'm in, in the reptile space, a lot of companies don't even have to put what's on or what's in the, the products that they have. And mm. so there's a, a leg up to, um, you know, the bioactive side in the reptile space. Uh, we're just using a soil system that is, you know, next to me, I have my bearded dragon. I have peonia soil in there. And when he defecates with all of the other life that I have in there, I don't have to ever pick that up. And that is such a big difference to the average person that has these kind of weird animals uh, is that they have to clean up after it two, three times a day. And it smells to the high heaven. So that's the that's other good. thing with terpenes. You know, you want mm -hmm. you want to have these healthy plants and you want to have these healthy soil systems, because for whatever reason, that life, the, the springtails and then eventually the isopods, just break down the defecation, the shedding. They love snake skin. I saw somebody saying that in the chat. If you have these things in your grows, I mean, in your rooms, put them in your grows mm -hmm. instead of throwing them away. The chitin and the uh, the actual protein, there, there's a calcium in the snake skin, uh, shed. Uh, for whatever reason, if you're into like the dairy cows, Mark, I'm, I'm sorry, Marco, that's mm -hmm. uh, that's something that is next level, I think, with all of a sudden you'll see, it, it probably takes about a month, but you'll see a ton of little babies kind of fi finishing off that the snake uh, shedding. And there's something to uh, adding all of these, what once used to be alive kind of skin. I don't know the best way to say that, but like something that's been alive, that's decomposing, Organic even if it's food. leaves. Exactly. Like. I was trying to think of a better word than, but from, from an animal as well. So organic matter, whether it came from leaves or whether it came from an animal shedding, there's something special to that. And then I also saw in chat where people are talking about more like acorns and avocado tech. When there is a nut in, in that and the, the life breaks it down, there's something special to that as well. And I, I hope that we as a community can start to learn more about this because for whatever reason, man, if you're running acorns and you're running avocado tech, uh, in your living soil systems and they're, they've been kind of alive for a little bit, the explosion of growth that happens from that and the meal almost that, that is there from the top of the acorns, uh, those break down a little bit slower for whatever reason that kind of, uh, binds in with everything else. And there's just some magic to that. And I don't necessarily understand it, but I hope that you guys play around with it so that you can kind of see for yourself that, playing with the seeds and then using a cover crop and growing healthy calcium, like using different versions of calcium, mm -hmm. playing around with these soil systems. I'm seeing different success in my little world now that I also eventually saw success in, in the cannabis space. And when I first did this in the cannabis space using house and garden products, I basically grew hay. I grew stuff that it was, it was average at best basically. And then after a few weeks, it just never kept the, that terpene profile. And so there's a lot to what we're talking about today. And not only does Bart understand soil systems, but he understands it on a very large commercial uh, mm -hmm. scale. And the, as far as I know, Bart, there's probably a couple handfuls of people that still run it at the level that you do. And he's a home grower. That's why that's why it's so cool. Yeah, well, thanks. And, and that's why I got into it was the love of the craft and we've all had that experience where you get a, get a soil and you think, you know what you've got. And then all of a sudden it acts totally different than it did last year. And <clears throat> I always hated that. And I always felt like there's gotta be a way to make it consistently. And yeah, I mean, you know, we're not the biggest of the biggest. We're still a tiny little slice of the pie compared to miracle grow or even Fox farm or someone like that. But we've, we've definitely staked out our little slice of the pie and compared to a lot of the little local soil outfits and things like that. We, we keep shoving semis all winter long these days. And in the summer, it's, it's a couple semis a day when we're at full capacity um, for the, for this season that's coming up. 
um, we're, we're going to be cranking it out and we, we increase our capacity pretty significantly every year. So I feel blessed to, to have that kind of growth and especially in an environmental climate post COVID where, where things were so tough and tricky. I really, I really feel like, you know, I need to give a shout out to all of our supporters with the soil co and it's why I'm planning to try not to sell this one out or anything like that. I want to, it's, it's a relationship between me and the grower. And I remember what that was like. I still deal with it. I mean, sure. It's luxurious when I can just go out and be like, fetch me a tote, you know? And, uh, and I feel, I feel like I've really made it or something like that. But, um, nonetheless, like it, even, even the smallest grower buying a, a single bag of soil is just as important to me. And, and for them to know what they're getting and for them to get the performance out of that is super critical to us. And, and I didn't realize how hard that was. It, it, uh, it really was, it, it seemed like it was going to be easy in the beginning. I'm like, okay, I know this is hard and this is hard, but it was a really humbling experience. The first several years of running the soil company, like, I just kept having wake up call after wake up call that it was not going to be nearly as easy as it, as it was. And we have so many protocols and procedures in place now, like when we're building, you know, nutrients for batches, we have three to five eyes on every operation all the time with checklists um, just to ensure nothing ever happens. And when, when you're building your, thousandth or two thousandth batch of soil <clears throat> like everybody's going to get a little bit you know complacent maybe and so we have to work really hard to keep everybody's attention level up and to make sure multiple eyes are looking at everything and on the rare occasion that you know somebody's maybe like oh did i put that in there or something we'll just burn a thousand dollar batch right then on the spot to know that we're not going to ship something that that isn't right and mm -hmm. um, that's a know, tough one but that's you got to do it right to, to make sure your quality is there what do you do push that off to the side let that sit over there for a minute we'll yeah, figure out what we're going to do we've got a topsoil pile and i'll use okay. it in my landscaping or something like that um any of those batches and, and it's rare that it happens but every once yeah, in a yeah. while you know, the checks and balance system will be like, Hey, this one's, this one's short a yard or whatever. And then, Oh, everything has to stop. And we go back and do a bunch of internal analysis. Why, <clears throat> why is it wrong? You know, and then you send it off to the lab and it, it really it can be stressful and tricky and it's what it takes if you want to put out the same product. And it was probably five years in on the company that I finally really became obvious to me, you know, I thought I could make a better soil than most of the people in the business, but I thought they were at least making the same thing every time. And after testing almost everything else on the market over and over for years, I realized, oh my gosh, like every one of these bags is significantly different. Even on the same palette, I would mm -hmm. see soils all the time from major national brands that were completely different both minerally and biologically from, from two bags in the same, or from four bags, four bags in the same palette would be completely different. And that was shocking to me. And it's something the consumer really needs to be aware of is how, how inconsistent a lot of mixes on the market are. And really, I feel like it's one of the flaws in the continuous mix line system is that, you know, while it can put out the volumes people want, if you have one chunk of something clogging one of those feeders, which basically the way those systems work is it's a bunch of hoppers with big belts and the belts are all driving at a certain rate. And if there's any, any clump or something that clogs the output of that, now all of a sudden your ratio is completely off. And it's happening so fast that a lot of times by the time somebody notices that they've got an issue 
they've already made a thousand yards of soil or something like that. And so, yeah. and, and the big boys ain't going to throw that away. So it's nope. <laughs> one of the reasons why I'm willing to take the hit on efficiency and why our soil costs more is we've got three really big ass batch mixers. And then at least each time we know it's that amount of everything that went into that batch. <clears throat> and it gives us a control on making a more consistent product than mm -hmm. the way a Hypenax or a Fox Farm or something makes their stuff. Yeah. Speaking of them, man, Fox Farm shit. I remember seeing bags like seeing them. This one's darker, moister, looks way better. This one's drier, lighter, browner, like two bags, like, you know, when you, putting shit together back in the day and that was visually that wasn't even thinking about it how the blend was even mixed um so that's a key point right there man quality so if I, let's just say I'm, I'm like man bart i need a you know, two tractor trailer loads of soil what what are you i know there's no really guarantees in life but what can you tell me that i'm gonna get you know what am i not gonna get what you know what i'm saying because i've heard some horror stories where people bought a lot more soil than that and then they fucking get some shit you know so I make saw, me feel good yeah thanks and and i did i saw a poor guy who'd spent a million dollars on a local soil company soil for his big ass commercial grow and um he couldn't pass his heavy metals test and they didn't want to deal with it and so, yeah, it's, it can be a horror story, especially when you've got a lot of money on the line, which is why it, it makes it so important. But, you know, what I can say is that everything that's, that's on our label is going to be in that soil. Um, and that we, we work to make it the same every time. And if we're going to make a change, we're going to make that change super slowly over years. And, uh, and then once you know, it gets warm enough outside. We're back out there inoculating um, the nematodes, <clears throat> and um, yeah, you're 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 going to have fully balanced mineral nutrition in our soil. Like you're gonna you're gonna really everything is built in, and there are very few mixes on the market that are that way. It's so easy for them to take some bark and some horse piss and some salts and whatever and stir it all up and throw some peat in there and be like here you go you figure it out as a grower and and that is so hard it's where i think this whole concept of like it's a term i hate but i've got a black thumb or whatever you know i just don't even think there is such a thing in this world i think it's just that people don't know what's in their soil and and they're hung out to dry. And if you don't have the expertise that you Marco or you Brian have to know, ah, oh, that's why this is happening. And I'm going to move, move and adapt to these soil conditions, then they're going to have a hard time and, and they're probably going to crash their ship. <laughs> and so it's crazy to me that the whole industry was basically based on that, you know, up until, some of these more super soil uh, recipes came came on the scene and then got commercialized. Um, and and the folks in early in the organic farming and gardening movement saw that too. It's just that they believed you had to build that soil naturally, um, where basically what I'm doing is taking 22 ingredients and essentially trying to emulate what you would find on a forest floor and do that exactly the same every time. So um, that's, that's mostly what you would find in our stuff is, is us putting a lot of work into it, putting more ingredients in and not jumping on any of the hype ingredients that could drive sales for us. Like if I told people I love biochar, <laughs> there's going to, we're, we're going to open up probably, 10% more sales right away there from the biochar heads and lovers. But in our mix, I can't drive what I want. I can't drive more species diversity. When I add the types of biochar I've added to our mix, we get a reduction in species diversity. Now, I'm not saying that biochar does that to every soil. I'm not saying that biochar is never helpful. 
At what percent again? Were you? Oh, um, I mean, when when I get above about five percent biochar, yeah. that's not good. I get a radical reduction in right. certain fungal species. I can believe it. Yep. And and to me, it's like, you know, once again, you got to look back to nature. Like the forest doesn't burn that often. Are there microbes that are going to thrive in a in a burnt forest environment sure <clears throat> you know but do you just want a million of those but you know do you want your space your soil rhizome rhizosphere dominated by those organisms i don't i want the species diversity and it's not natural like where in nature are you going to have a fire in a vacuum you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> like that doesn't happen that's very right, right, right. much in nature. And so once again, that's what started steering me in that direction. And <clears throat> to me, what I saw through the scope really backed it up to the point where <clears throat> even though I could make more money by putting one of those niche ingredients in like that, and I catch a lot of grief from certain parts of the so-called natural regenerative living soil community i'm not going to do it if i can't make a change uh, mm -hmm. for the positive for the grower it's just my my contract with the end grower so what do you start, try to be at about three percent with um, biochar yeah, i don't yeah. i don't run any biochar oh you know none it. okay gotcha none. yeah i i just couldn't get the results out of it and i wanted Sweet. to so bad i tried and i tried mm -hmm. and it always sent me in the wrong direction, so we just don't run it. That's one of those things, man. If it don't fucking work, we ain't running it. Like, I mean, you don't just run shit to run it, right? I like that's that. it. No, it's and when you're saying that, you're saying that it's losing the diversity, the exact opposite of what everybody's been teaching, or some, or not everybody, but some people have been teaching about biochar is that it's like a little hotel and it builds up diversity. And I guess what you were teaching me is that does happen at the beginning. And then as things start to progress, there's less and less diverse. Well, that's it. And if you look at most of the studies done on biochar, they're done in these fields that have already been super beat up. You know, they've, they've been run with nitrates or this or that and the other. <clears throat> Very low carbon content, low organic matter, low biological activity. And so if you come in with some biochar and and put 5% or 7% biochar into that soil, it does do that. Like the species of bacteria that are adapted to decomposing burnt organic matter are going to take up residence in that hotel and they're going to thrive. But that's not necessarily the same thing as species diversity. And I feel like that's where the important distinction is, is do you want to culture a lot of these certain uh, microbes and you know in that dead soil having a bunch of those microbes can be helpful but in a living organic potting mix that's already 50 percent organic matter and has a significant species diversity <clears throat> the biochar kills certain fungals like they they don't do that well with it and so it's it's really this dichotomy where you can't just kind of make these generalizations and have them work out. You really have to look at the specific mechanisms and what exactly is happening. And, and that's one of the ones that I ran into with, with biochar was the distinction between the, the burn material, the carbaceous oils loving organisms and the carbaceous oils not loving organisms and a lot of the fungals don't seem to like those carbaceous oils in my experience when when we talk biochar some like diehards would say that not all biochar is the same and that when they're mm -hmm. speaking on biochar they're talking about like the glass version of the biochar that's the primo can you kind of break that down and what are your thoughts on that yeah, there could be something to that. I haven't done enough research to be able to show that every type of biochar on the market has this effect. But I tried several kinds over the years, and I haven't ever seen a kind of biochar that helps the soil I make. That's that's kind of my statement on it. 
Um, you know, I definitely don't want to disparage anyone's product. And I do think like in every other product category, there are higher quality and lower quality ways to make it. And I'll see people, <coughs> I'll see people write articles in some of these magazines about them making biochar where they, you know, don't even have a vacuum. Basically they're just burning wood, making charcoal or something like that and being like, Ooh, I made biochar, <coughs> you know, derp and words, words mean things. They're just a way for us to try and communicate. And so to truly make biochar, it has to be made through pyrolysis, which is essentially a no oxygen, a vacuum environment where the temperature is so hot that the, the cellulose, the carbon is, is undergoing this chemical process that would in the presence of oxygen be burning. Um, but because you don't have that oxygen, now it's turning into something else, which typically are these carbaceous oils. And so, yeah, there's, there's a, there is a lot to how, how you can make biochar and to making good biochar and just like <clears throat> making it in a fire pit where you are kind of smothering it a little bit doesn't, doesn't do it. And, and I do feel like that is an inferior product as far as the biochar world goes. Marco, you're uh, you kind of are more into that depth than that world. Do you mind uh, adding to that? Yeah. I mean, like we, uh, we do kind of stock uh, biochar. I wonder, I did a class. We taught folks how to make their own. And the key for me is, yeah, like Bart said, very sparingly. But then it's about that quench and that initial inoculation. Like I've gone to now, um, I just take my cannabis bio, um, cannabis char, which I make in an absence of oxygen in my Dutch oven deal. Um, and then I'll, I'll build my IMO with that now. So I'm almost forcing that char to take on those beneficial microbiology. You know what I'm saying? I'm not just leaving it at chance with putting it in there and then letting whoever likes biochar go there. You feel me? Um, so I, I just trying to steer it in my own direction a little bit. And some folks will do a quench with like Jadam microbial solution or things like that. And they feel like they kind of like that, that soaks that char right on up with, you know, the good stuff that we kind of like. Now, to Bart's point, does it survive in that char? You know what I'm saying? Uh, when it's in the soil, I don't know. But um, like I said, go go real sparingly on the char um, if I do use it in a, in a build, but mostly in the IMOs and stuff now. And that's one thing I have seen is that the folks who re-inoculate their char and, and do that work definitely have improved results. So I'm a mm -hmm. believer in that. Yeah. And there's a difference. Difference in the wood, because like if I make a chart from oak hardwood, it's different than that cannabis stock. That cannabis stock, if you think more like a cinnamon toast crunch flake, you know, kind of a little crisp. Whereas that even that oak, even if it's in a char form, I can't. It's no crisp. It's really still dense. You know what I mean? So I think the density helps, too, in that way. Interesting. Yeah, I think. um trying to understand it like when everybody's talking about the, the glass aspect and the high-end stuff do you think it's more of like a cedar where the like it's a quality place to stay but the microbes aren't necessarily breaking it down so they're just able to i don't know bounce around more i don't, I don't know the right terminology but like if you had this hotel and everybody's hanging out and then those those uh resources go away then people i would think would just leave and come back leave and come back do you think that's kind of more what what you're doing is the, the the glass is more of a a place where it's i don't man I'm, I'm not articulating this the right way like when there when there's enough of the porous aspects to it you know how like almost anything can find its way into there but when it's glass it's a lot harder like it has to be a hardier microbe to probably even um, break down some of this because of the way it's made does that matter at all and i hope that makes sense yeah, are you asking me or Marco? I'm asking you. You've taught yeah, me a lot about I, biochar, by the way. You know, I don't know enough about the mechanism. And if I was, if I could get the results I was looking for, I would probably study it more. And I probably should just for when I get asked questions like this. But um, 
I guess, you know, the, the carbon in biochar is really stable and that's why it's, it would be real easy for client climate scientists to want to promote it because it really doesn't go anywhere. It, uh, it, it's very stable and yes, I feel like that creates that structure where biology can live and with, without being able to break it down, they still need to get food from somewhere. And so, you know, um, a little bit of the oils, the oils, especially the bacteria that like biochar, that's what they're mostly eating are those carbaceous oils. And that's why they thrive and you get these, you know, pretty rapid growth of these bacterial populations. <clears throat> and in certain dead soils, that's actually a huge advantage. You know, I think there's something really to that. But otherwise, you know, it's, it's where something like a molasses can go a long way in conjunction with biochar, I feel like is bringing in another source of, of fertility and food for that biology to consume. Because obviously they can't consume the structure of the biochar or it wouldn't be so stable. It would, it would be consumed and eaten up the way sawdust or wood chips or something like that is. And, and the fact that it is so stabilized like that also to me tells the story that the, <clears throat> the biology doesn't really like to eat it or can't eat it. Yeah. I think it's kind of like a, kind of like an appetite. It's not like a, a hors d'oeuvres, you know what I mean? Like it's not for everybody. <laughs> um, but yeah, man, I, I'll tell you, I, I, I think it's still on my Instagram, but like one of the largest pieces of fungal hyphae that I found just naturally was like I burned some wood and then just left it over there off to the side. And like one day I was just rummaging around and I flipped a piece of wood over and it was a thick, white, crazy thick fungi right up under that burnt piece of wood. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I still that is got cool. the picture. Yeah, I was really surprised. So I was like, damn, you know, so. For whatever it's worth could just be it was under a shady place and you know it was just doing what it does but i'm not saying it you know, directly correlated but it was pretty compelling that it was um living you know thick fungal hyphae right up under that char kind of stuck to it you know so this was not made in uh in the glass form so it could have been the interior of that wood could have still been a little woody as well and that fungi was kind of going into the trying to get to that you know, wood part too. So it's not definitive, but interesting. Yeah, super interesting. Uh, uh, we got quite a good amount of questions. So uh, for time's sake, and I know you're not feeling the best, uh, we can jump into these a little bit earlier to make sure you uh, answer them, Bart, because I guess that's one of the best things about you, man, is that you take the time to answer it. And some people come on our show and they, not everybody, but sometimes they answer it like a politician almost. And it's kind of silly. So we appreciate you taking the time and answering a lot of these. And shout out Thanks, to Rotten man. Skateboards, man. This dude is always asking really good questions. Yeah. And a yeah. lot of the questions that I, I I'm like, wow, I you know, I didn't even think of something like that. So uh we're gonna start off with him. He's got a couple of these rap, you know, we could do rapid fire if need be. Yeah, let's see what we got. All right, what are the most common micronutrients, trace minerals coming up short in soil testing? Pretty much every soil I test. With, I, I would say less than five percent of the soil I test is um, is adequately amended with boron. Um, almost always boron is is uh, <clears throat> problematic, and <clears throat> the mainstream agronomists will tell you one ppm boron. I like two ppm's boron. It was interesting to me. I started trying to push boron in some of my research many years ago and it was the cookies based strains in particular i feel like they were bred in a low to no boron environment they did not like three four ppms of boron like at four ppms of boron a lot of the cookies based strains really tanked and so but but uh i think two ppms is a nice middle of the line where you're pushing boron, you're strong in boron, you're going to get all those benefits, the plant immune functions, 
so forth and so on and not not have any deficiency um and then you know zinc and manganese are the other the other two and strangely enough i don't know why this is but if if i see a lot of zinc or manganese <clears throat> then there won't be much of the other one and so a lot of the soils around here more like down towards delta have huge amounts of manganese in them i'll see you know 90 ppm's manganese or something crazy like that and all of those soils will be zinc deficient and <clears throat> that's the other thing to remember about some of these metallic trace minerals is that when they're in naturally occurring in the soil they're tied up in their metallic form and they're really not bioavailable at all so you you really can see these outrageous trace mineral numbers on a test and then not not have it show up and it's why a soluble test is also so important at the same time to see what of the uh what of the trace minerals is actually getting able to get to the plant without significant biological intervention so yeah i would say zinc and manganese are my next two next to most commonly deficient trace minerals and it's always that intervenal chlorosis with zinc and manganese you know you'll have those distinct bright green and i can't remember which way it, i'm pretty sure it's the the veins are bright green and in between are the the faded patches and when i see that you know maybe it's a lockout but i would say more than half the time it's it's a a zinc or manganese deficiency. Uh, next one from Rotten. Um, how can a foiler feed feeding micronutes trace minerals assist in soil growth? Well, I mean, it really just depends on if you're getting the uptake or not. Like a foliar really helps out if you're not able to get those trace minerals there any other way. Like Oftentimes, to me, the foliars are a, a really great recovery method. Um, if you if you have enough of it, then I somewhat avoid certain types of foliars because, <clears throat> once again, you're gaming the system, you're gaming the pathways, and whatever you put on there, the plant has to eat it. On the other hand, if I know I've got a calcium deficiency or something like that, a foliar is a great way to to bypass the whole ion pumping plant root all the other junk and just get it in there quick so for me that's that's where i like to use foliars is if i've got a problem and if i don't have a critical situation then i'll really hold back more on the foliars in general although i do i do like um, in y'all's world, like a silica nettle or a horsetails, silica nettle, like if I've got that ferment, if I've got that available, then, then I'll do that foliar a couple times a season, really just to pump the daylights out of the silica. And that was one of the other interesting things about silica is like in this article, you know, um, uh, how you can, you can mitigate an overabundance. Let's say we do have too much plant available manganese in the soil or aluminum or um, cadmium or lead, then silica can disable and tie up those unwanted metals in high quantity. So here's, here's an instance where we might actually want to use silica to, we, we might want lockout as an advantageous position for us and so of the heavy metals yep yeah, yeah. you can you can lock them out with additional right. silica that's why i like that bamboo i didn't know that <laughs> that component of it but it makes sense for sure shredded bamboo yeah. there you go yeah this this article is saying a healthy disease resistant soil 
should probably have 100 ppm of monosalicylic acid, although most soils are lucky enough to have a third of that. What's your silica source? Just sand? Uh, kind of mul yeah. micronized, pulverized? Yeah, and then when it's it's fascinating how like monocots have a high level of silica like rice um i'm kind of into some of these um and a lot of our mixes have rice holes in them for aeration and drainage like the the microforest complete uses rice holes organic non-gmo brown rice holes and man they are just packed full of silica they're primarily silica and so that's a big a big cool way to get silica and potentially soluble silica are from products made from rice holes. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, last question, I think, from Rotten, releasing that the first wave. Uh, do living soil beds indoors have a seemingly infinite source? I think he means of trace minerals, micronutrients. No, definitely not. And especially not when dealing with cannabis because the plant is going to consume it. And, you know, especially when you're taking harvesting part of the plant, <clears throat> then those are all minerals that are leaving. And you can bioconcentrate them somewhat, but it's why in organic regenerative farming, cover cropping is such a critical part of the game. And why I feel like people that aren't running cover crops are often missing out. And some of my commercial growers that I've helped to increase their margins the most are running like a three bed system where they have their A beds, B beds, and C beds. And in their off time, they're actively growing cover crops in those off season beds. It also kind of breaks the, the life cycle of pests and pathogens. But one of the important things that it does is it's allowing you to take sunlight and convert it into these critical plant nutrients and those are that's less inputs you're going to have to purchase yourself but yeah there is no such thing as a free lunch and it's why crop rotation is important cover crops are important and if you're not doing those then you're going to have to amend there's just no no two ways about it the the final element of that is that the biology can bioconcentrate it but like Ingham's assertion that you don't need to worry about minerals and the biology is going to just magically fix it all for you. I find to not hold true in the real world. Um, or at least nobody has time. They don't have the seven to 10 years to wait around for the biology to gather this stuff up from the environment and the atmosphere. You, you have to be proactive about that. And then once you get it in the balance, I find that the soils stay there better you know, it, but, but if you keep taking a crop out, it's also like lawns. I see people with their lawns you bagging, know, <laughs> bagging the clippings, throwing taking the away. time to rake it first. Yeah. Right. All that craziness. And, and it's why people have to dethatch lawns and crazy shit like that. Cause they've yep. killed all the biology with their nitrates and then their grass is leaving. And so now all these plants, nutrients are leaving and i think the reason they have to bag their clippings is because there's no biology to decompose yep. the clippings so then they just sit there forever in a healthy lawn environment we've helped so many people and lawns get a bad name these days but actually i kind of like lawns in that they mm -hmm. keep the soil cool they there's no void um especially good for picnics great for picnics you know, a good species diverse lawn, there's a lot to it. And it just seems so crazy to me when people take all their clippings and throw them away. Yeah. I know in the fall, I can look out now. I don't rake my leaves. I fucking blow all the leaves onto the grass, evenly all over the grass, literally. Yeah. And now all those leaves have just, you know, withered on down. And then we'll be coming to spring soon and the grass will pop back up and I'll start mowing. Sometimes I'll just mow them in and mulch the leaves in. But yeah, man, you live and learn. And I like doing shit the easy way. I look at my neighbors bagging up and usually I'll take those bags over to my to my farm. <laughs> I'll take that. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, man. 
Uh, shout out to another uh, gentleman that we see each and every week, J5FHO20. If outdoor and ground and beds can't most micro newts be mined naturally from the earth? They could be, but they're not plant available. So like, you know, when I was in Ireland, I was like, ooh, a manganese mine. Look at that. And then I started really looking into it and they're just not bioavailable. And those metals there's almost nothing that can break down manganese. So it's why in organic farming, Omri allows for synthetics in some of these micronutrients. Um, you know, zinc sulfate and manganese sulfate are basically like vitamin grade synthetics that are really simply made in the same way like a gypsum is formed. Um, gypsum being a salt of calcium, calcium sulfate, like zinc sulfate and manganese sulfate are some of the only ways you're going to find a bioavailable source of zinc or manganese out there. Um, so while you can get zinc and manganese out of the ground, they're not going to do anything for you because they're tied up in their metallic form. And so really those are the only synthetics I ever mess with are um, zinc sulfate and manganese sulfate. Uh, this is more of a like comment, but I just wanted to highlight because I think more and more people are starting to see it. Uh, from Little Mac, shout out to that game. Right? That was a fun game when I was little. We seem to be realizing how important calcium and CO2 can be to increased growth. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that and also say that, especially when it comes to CO2 and adding that, that is the cherry on top. Uh, like we kind of mentioned, if the plant isn't growing healthy and it's not green and vibrant and have praying leaves and all of that, then CO2, in my opinion, uh, is probably a waste of money at that point. Uh, Hugely. You yeah, you want to really make sure that it's dialed in. So, yes, it can help with increased growth. I'm sure these guys can add much more to it, but I just wanted to put that caveat that that is kind of like the fat, the last little thing to uh, dot the I, cross the T in your room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me, is adding uh, CO2. That's it. it. To me, it's the calling card of a novice grower is when the first thing they start with is their CO2 and their burners and their tanks and all of that BS. It's like, bro, spend your time somewhere else. Like start mm -hmm. with all of the other things you can fix. And we, we remember that quintessential image out of the old grower's guides um, of like the barrel with the slats. And if any one of those slats is short, that's where your peak level is going to be. Mm -hmm. And so I say work on everything else first before you start pumping CO2. I mean, does it have an effect if you have everything else right? Yeah, absolutely it does. But I've, I've grown plants for over 30 years that blow people's minds as far as yield, as far as taste, as far as this, as far as that. And... And there have only been a couple of grows in my whole life that I've ever run CO2 in. So I'm still relatively like, hey, it's cool if that's the last hole you need to fill. But if you're doing that before you worry about, you know, your trace minerals or your biology or something else, then I think you're missing the boat personally. Yeah, well, calcium, so. calcium. Yeah, calcium is the trucker of the minerals. It is what transports almost everything else into the plant. And it has so many different aspects to plant health, plant nutrition. Can't say enough about calcium, but you can't leave it in a vacuum. You need, you know, you need, of course, the magnesium, you need sulfur. Um, and so, so get that balance going of all those, but also, you see the agronomists, the, some of the old school agronomists from CSU used to be like, oh, you've got 2000 ppm calcium. You don't need any more calcium. And it's like, wait a minute. Most of that calcium is tied up in alkalinity and you're not delivering it to the plant. And so that's a prime time when I'm going to come in with some gypsum. And a lot of these organic farms out here in the North Fork had massive results with gypsum in spite of the fact that they were already at ridiculous calcium levels. I'll see farms that are, that'll be at 4,000, 5,000, 6,000. I've even seen some of these places with 
20, 30,000 PPMs of calcium and, and they'll still get a noticeable improvement in plant physiology because none of that calcium is available. And that's usually why you have these high calcium levels is that they're locked up and not available for the plant to use. Uh, I was trying to bring this up when you kind of here's here's one the mono mono ammonium phosphate I I don't like it I wouldn't run it somebody's asking about using that it games the system it's another salt you're just going back to the whole salt game again <clears throat> and so why why wouldn't you try getting your phosphorus from other natural sources shot that down <laughs> Uh, from Lisa, uh, did Bart talk about paramagnetism of soil yet? That's another thing that I feel like I can uh, understand maybe the definition, but when people are dissecting it and that kind of thing, I get a little lost. That's it. And paramagnetism is a, a cool thing. And it's one of those things that lands. I have to try to, there's, there's a part of me that wants to be such a scientist that I like get a little annoyed with some more with, with the, the parts of growing that I can't see or quantify yet. I do really feel like there's something to paramagnetism and energy and several of the, the inputs we use in our potting mix have paramagnetic properties. And like, I kind of joke a little, but my, uh, the ramp that I built into the property for the soil co is all built out of these basalt rocks, several, several feet thick. And so as the forklifts of soil are traveling out, they're going through a giant paramagnetic field. And, and so <laughs> that's tight. I'll, I'll, I'll say that that's part of why, why we have these results, but I haven't seen enough good research into paramagnetic qualities. And I think there needs to be more, and I think there really could be something to paramagnetism in soil. <clears throat> and what's the, there was this guy that used to call me all the time. Oh, he's trying to sell me zeolite. I think was the, he, he claimed he had like the most paramagnetic properties of any input you can have. And I would try it out and I couldn't really tell a significant difference between his stuff, but I do think there's something to it and that we all ought to look into paramagnetism more. Do you have to, um, on the rainy spells, are you covering up so you don't leach out um, any of your, you know, the input you put into the soil? Well, we don't have like piles of soil out in the weather or something like that. Like we, okay. all of our inputs are pretty sealed up, usually in bulk bags and under tarps or inside in our nutrient building. Where's your soil under your soils under roof too? Well, it's all, it's all into totes. Like our system is designed to, to fill okay. totes. I got you. And so, um, yeah. Well, I mean, even when you're building it, so you got this pile, you just blended the pile today. Now, where is uh, that? We, we blended in the mixers. We've got the big batch mixers and it all goes in there. And then and straight to totes and straight into the totes and it's crazy to see like when you've got 50 percent organic matter in this batch it can be pouring torrential rain outsides and we do have the ability to cover the mixers and things like that but it can rain torrentially all night and maybe a one eighth inch top layer of the soil and the mixer will be wet okay like it's it's wild how much hydrophobic water Hydro, hydrophilic well it's not the water isn't running off anywhere okay it's just it's just the absorptive capacity and it's that old there's there's the number i talk about a lot that if you double your organic matter it's a 300 percent increase in the water holding capacity of the soil hmm. so all these nitrated fields that i see that are one percent organic matter if you take them from one percent to two percent now that's a 300 percent increase in the water holding capacity of the soil. So you can think about a potting mix with 50% organic matter. 
Mm. It is wild how many thousands of gallons that mix can absorb without without even coming close to having a leachate or a runoff. And your moisture is one of the parameters you check in each batch to batch, obviously. Like for sure. We change it, we change moisture seasonally, and it's why we don't don't price our soil based on the ton is we don't want to be limited. In the summer when things are hot and the biology is alive and growing, then we need a lot more water in there to to keep all those thirsty microbes mm -hmm. well well watered. Whereas in the winter when the biology is dormant and people don't want a 450 pound ice cube delivered to them, then we'll dial our water content way back and um, and try to help growers out in that way. I like that. Question from Mad Dog. What is good for lowering the pH of touch in living soil? Uh, to me, it would be like, especially in a bed, do you even think that you'd be able to do that, especially if you're running worms? I would think that they would be in control of that. Well, so it really depends. Like the best place I like to attack pH is in the water. And particularly if you have alkaline water, because then you can have that hydrogen exchange happen. Like I, I like citric acid a lot. Um, I think it's one of the most gentle acids and still you don't want pure citric acid in contact with the life in your soil because you know, it's, it's going to have a problem. You're going to have that exchange and you're going to burn that biology with that acid. But if you can, do the buffering ahead of time um, with uh, with citric acid, and then particularly in your water. Now you've really accomplished something. So it's to me, it's about not having radical swings in pH. The more the more you can have this buffering effect, the happier the plant's going to be, the happier the biology is going to be than if you let it get way out of control and then you come really aggressively and swing it back the other way, that's when the problems really happen. But yeah, if I, even, even sometimes that's called for, I mean, my buddy had this soil at his place in his, in, on his property. And it was fascinating how from a mineral profile perspective, it was perfectly balanced, but his pH was like, eight, eight or something like that. And so everything was locked out. And so I did have him broadcast spread citric acid. You know, he spent a 40 pound bag on like an acre and forgot about it. And it was really dry and arid. And then a couple of weeks later, a big rainstorm came along and it freaked him out at first because his whole yard was sizzling. It was like the kids baking soda, volcano <laughs> yeah his his yard turned into the volcano and he didn't know what was happening he tripped out so uh so you know if you do that don't don't scare yourself um and it's rare that a condition calls for that aggressive of a, a strategy but in the very alkaline west <clears throat> there are times when you just need to get some acid out there and try and get things down to the point where like you're saying, Brian, the worms can take over or the other biology can take over or the plant root exudates, the acidic plant root exudates can take over. So, um, all yeah. life needs more acid, bro. There you go. <laughs> no doubt. We ain't going to argue that one. <laughs> shout out to trippy grows um so his question is is it safe to just let the rain flush at flush out your dirt after grows i leave the used dirt in my garden for six months then reuse is this safe i have reused it many times yeah i think it's completely safe i mean any of your solubles might get washed out um if you've got a bunch of soluble nitrogen in there or something like that then you maybe don't don't want to do that so much, or if you're in a really um, heavy precipitation area, then you then you're just going to kind of waste some of your valuable soluble nutrients. But um, it can it can work well. And and once again, too, if 
if you have enough organic matter and your soil can absorb that, then that's just going to be water for your biology to drink. So, um, yeah, I think, I think that it's fine in most climates in a really wet climate, you probably don't want to do that. Um, but as long as you're not washing away a bunch of, bunch of nitrogen or something, then sure. This next question is probably a little more for Marco, uh, from Chris. So does the comfrey and like the dead nettle JLF have a lot of amino acids in it? Um, yeah, I like to ferment those too, though, to get the, to get some nice aminos, uh, you know, fermented plant extract, if you will, are nice. But yeah, JLF with those, those are both dynamic accumulators. Yeah, amino, mass, amino acids are going to come in when the microbes start breaking that stuff down into those forms. Um, so yeah, I mean, I say yeah. Art, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, basically, like, all it, it's the greens and browns thing again anything that's green is going to have some nitrogen in it and it's going to be there mostly as aminos and so just like marco said when you do that ferment <coughs> you're going to concentrate those aminos and so um other than just like pure carbony stuff woody plant tissue <coughs> you're going to have you're going to, you're going to, you're going to pick up some aminos. I thought this was an interesting question from crazy J ladybug laid eggs all over the power adapter. Anyone else had this problem or similar? What do you do? Oh, cause it was warm. Probably. <laughs> uh, it was like a uh, nice warm spot, but at the ladybug bug larvae, uh, they look like little alligators. That's really more what you're after. And from my experience playing around with ladybugs, that's actually pretty hard to achieve uh, mm -hmm. to get them to do that. So you might be onto something with your environment. Exactly. It's like their micro prop mat. Right. Push that. Yeah. Congrats. I would maybe, uh, just let them, let them be because observe that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, replicate if you can as long as they don't crawl into the other outlet or something like that. A <laughs> uh, question from Astral. In soil, how do you transition the ratios for veg versus flower? You could add extra at whatever time point, but how would you lower existing amounts? They say you wanted to reduce the nitrogen. So um, I'm never really see, working to reduce the nitrogen. I'm looking to build phos and potassium and flour. And that's the thing about fixing soil is it's almost impossible to take something out but i see a lot of people who let their plants go too nitrogen deficient in flower and they end up losing a lot of yield out of that <clears throat> so like i'm not a fan of this mega nitrogen deficiency um you know thing that that a lot of people have going on but basically my regimen is that all all and, and it's why my soil isn't made to be a no feed soil. Like some of the super soils have so much nitrogen built in that you never have to feed any nitrogen. When I do that, I start killing my species diversity again. So I, I like to add some nitrogen over the course of the grow. And that can be through something like feather meal. It can be through methods like Marco uses. It can be, um, there, there's so many ways to get that nitrogen, but then I'll hit about a week before flower. I'll do a top dressing of a, of like compost. Compost is my favorite flower newt and it's really underrated because you can think of most composts like a one, two, three, you know, and then you're also getting calcium, magnesium, zinc, boron, trace minerals, biology, you'd have to get seven products in a grow store to um, make the equivalent flower newt that compost handles all in one. Plus a lot of, of what's in the compost is bioavailable because it's already been fully biologically broken down. So um, I'll, I'll do that and I'll, I'll usually do my fossilized seabird guano at the same time. And um, it's a zero ten zero, and 
that is my throttle for FOSS strain dependent. Like in veg, my amino nitrogen is my throttle and I, I let the soil carry everything else. And in flower, my FOSS is the throttle strain dependent. And so um, I really like the addition of that fossilized seabird guano. If you've got a really FOSS hungry strain, then I might actually push that seabird guano harder than, than I would with a, a less hungry strain. And so I usually do that top dressing twice. I do it once a week before flower and then once two, three weeks later. And then I kind of set it and forget it. And then instead of trying to get nitrogen out, actually by the end of the growth, so like during that time, I'm not feeding any nitrogen because the compost has a lot of nitrogen in it, even though it's only 1% compared to the two and three of the, of the FOSS, um, the plant still needs that. <clears throat> and then depending if I'm growing like big, big plants for a long season, I might even come in again with a little bit of soy based amino nitrogen before the end. And then about three weeks from harvest, I'll just cut it all off. I won't feed anything. And I'll really try to let the plant eat up the rest of, of any fertility or the significant amount of fertility that's in there. Um, and so it's not really a flush, but it, it does kind of get rid of any nutrient that might affect the taste in that way. All I want to be tasting are those secondary metabolites, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of my quick and easy set it and forget it like uh, formula. And I've done so many side by sides where, um, I went nitrogen deficient and I radically reduced my yield compared to the control where I kept a little bit of amino nitrogen going. So I realize that's a, a different opinion than a lot of people have, but I've, I've done the science on this and I feel strongly I'm able to, to keep a lot of weight up by keeping just a little bit of nitrogen going longer than most people would. Well said. Yeah, yeah. Um, we shout out to uh, a lot more of the international uh, audience. Uh, they're coming in. They have, you know, not not necessarily basic questions, but like early entry type questions. Uh, some of these aha moments I've been noticing for some people over the the last few weeks, to be honest, where people are trying to understand. Uh, I, I think a lot of people when they first hear this, if, the, if this is so brand new to you, it just sounds too good to be true. Until your mind starts to understand that Mother Nature's out there doing it, so why yeah. would you know? And I, I think that's kind of the road that a lot of people are <laughs> starting to go down. Uh, Bart, outside of the cannabis community, it's it's where it's. I feel like they're in the phase of, well, how does this work? Like I don't understand. Like why would I have to? Because before I, I was into the isopods, it was like almost like gospel common knowledge that you had to constantly change out your substrates. Uh, that was just the way that it was done. And then I've been showing that that doesn't necessarily have to be done. If you're using a healthy soil and you're top feeding, you're using composting worms. I'm adding IMOs from all over the country. You know, shout out to both of you for and part of that's that build. And I don't have to tend to my isopod the same way that others do. So then when it gets into the reptile space, I think there's just so many opportunities. And we talk about it on the show because at some point that wave is going to start to die down. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there's a huge wave to this for people that are knowledgeable at this point, this day and age, 2024. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity in your local area. And then I wanted to finish out with the Aussie Frost, Frost King. So terpenes communicate with the microbes, which I'm led to believe is why LSO can get over 3% terps when most plants won't go over 1.8. And I think uh, – that's not true. I think a lot of plants are doing four percent or more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going. We're going. We're going. We're in the fours. We in the fours, man. We're going on up. fours and higher. But yeah, there there is this communication, and I haven't seen a, the direct science on terpenes communicating with the biology. I have no doubt that they can, but definitely some of these other secondary metabolites that are VOCs like terpenes can. I mean, what was that one that Aaron Appleby was all into? Methyl salicate. 
Like that's a crazy secondary metabolite that the, the plants can use to draw in um, beneficial organisms. And he could get synthetic methyl salicate super cheap. And so here's a place where like a synthetic might be really promising in organic farming is just as an attractant to, um, to beneficial insects and, and to call in that biology. Um, what's, what is LSO in his question? Is that a strain he's saying? Yeah, is that a strain? So. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I, I can't remember what it was. It, it was a real popular one for a while. There's a lot of ones that kind of popped up, uh, especially when you're trying to be the Frost King uh, in the early days. And so it was more like the Romulan and stuff. And so Romulan was called, I think, LSO, some other ones out there. So I'm not 100% on the, mm -hmm. the lineage, but I think a lot of the early stuff that potentially could now be international, a lot of that comes back to Romulan. Uh, when you're talking that kind of stuff. So maybe uh, look into those genetics. Uh, we could ask the chat. I'm sure somebody knows uh, what LSO stands for. Mm -hmm. The last question that we have of the the day, uh, Hamos Outdoors, uh, what mulch do you recommend that works well with your soil? The one you build. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's it. And, and yeah. mulch is a tricky thing. Like, I love mulch. I'm not going to say I never use mulch, but as much as I can, if I can have a living mulch, I mm -hmm. really like that. I, you know, my standard go-to for <clears throat> hemp operations and things like that is I really love like a Dutch white clover. It never gets tall. You don't have to mow it. Um, it's, you've got the nitrogen fixing effect. You've got the biology on the roots. <clears throat> um, you know, you can't grow carrots and things like that under under clover but nice small okay. clover yeah there you go i see you <clears throat> i can't say enough about it and out here where bindweed is so bad you can completely suppress bindweed with white dutch clover um once you get into wood mulches and leaf mulches and things like that there's a whole nother world of like lignans and um potential toxins in certain types of wood. Um, but if, if it's what you've got, if, if, you know, I wouldn't use like a walnut wood mulch or sawdust or anything like that. Once again, your oaks probably a little sus as well, but you know, I'm, I'm, not, against, I'm not against a pine wood mulch if that's what you've got to try to suppress some weeds. The thing about wood mulches is you just, once again, have to be really conscious of this carbon to nitrogen ratio. And if you're going to load up on a bunch of pure carbon, you know, wood 600 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio, then you need to be loading up on some amino nitrogen. And it's <coughs> kind of the, uh, kind of the like Achilles heel of Hugel culture is that you've got these guys loading these beds up with all these logs and shit. And then not adding enough nitrogen. So if I'm doing a Hugel mound, I'll be sprinkling feather meal all over that to begin with to try to keep it in balance. And it's the same thing with a mulch. If you're going to be coming in with a mulch, then I'll usually start with the sprinkling of feather meal or a product like our longevity, which is high in feather meal <coughs> because you're, you're staying closer. You want, you want a carbon to nitrogen ratio of at the most 20 to one. Um, and I, I like to be even a little lower than that. So that's kind of the key to wood mulches is, is to just be careful about um, over carboning because then the biology is going to say, Oh, to process all this carbon, I need nitrogen. It's going to steal it from the plant. And now the plant's going to go nitrogen deficient. And that's what a lot of agronomists call nitrogen lockout. Yeah, get an alfalfa, man. Get some organic alfalfa straw, hay, and freaking use that for mulch if you want to go mulch. I used to just only do mulches, and I said, let me let me, let me dabble with the uh, living kind of mulches or companions, and uh, I've been really loving those a lot more. It seems like my my easier to kind of water my soils, easy, you know, kind of kind of a little bit more diversity in there with those roots from those plants instead of just the mulch, you know. 
Amen there to go. that. And there's something too when the plant is giving out those sugars. Uh, I, I do it in all my worm bins now. I inoculate with just a tablespoon or two per bin. I mean, it, it goes a long, long way. I was guys, I was showing you like with the Dutch white clover, we're both talking about, I mean, we're talking pennies here to be able to grow that stuff up. Mm. Uh, uh, chop and drop. It's very easy to take care of. And all of a sudden, if you even just stick, I mean, that little uh, thing I had there still fits a little avocado. So enjoy the avocado, give it to your kids, however you enjoy it, you know, the expensive part of it. And then you put, or if it goes bad, obviously, uh, put it in there, man, and it will take off uh, with the composting worms, with the rogue beetles. There's a lot of weird, like, orbited mites, as, as I understand mm. it. Sometimes, uh, Marco, it's like white blobs. I know I've even kind of uh, mm, messaged you mites. about those. Yeah, like, just, uh, they remind me of, like, the early Ghostbusters and stuff when, when they're mm -hmm. over there. But all of it just seems to be good, and it seems to be going in a cycle. And that's the thing that I think, uh, I hope you guys understand from Bart's point of view. I mean, that man's probably made more soil than most people uh, in a lifetime. And so to be able to have the consistency, uh, you know, a lot of people are, I don't know, maybe just complaining that some some brands, some of the brands you even mentioned, uh, Bart, some of the bigger brands are stepping on or, or cutting uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the high end um, ingredients to make it go a little bit further. That's why they some brands have started to add something called forest duff which is basically they just went out into the woods and threw that shit in the bag for you. So some people experience fungus gnats and stuff because of those reasons. And not all brands do that, uh, but it is starting to be a little eye-opening that some people are willing to do that, especially cutting their ingredients, I, I think is a little shady. Or it is shady. And, and tell them, Bart, that, that, that you ship everywhere. Like the chat's asking, hit up, hit up, yeah. Bart, hit up Brian on IG. Get, that you can get the soil, man. So the way the way we sell, we're wholesale only. Um, mm -hmm. So to, to come direct to us, you pretty much need to be buying semi loads. But we've got a network of resellers and it's in the states around Colorado. You know, on on that side, I would say like um, Oklahoma is kind of out at the edge of our range there. Missouri, um, there are stores that have us there. Um, I started this to really try to create a more localized product and be a little more environmental. And so it's tricky for me when I send a truck to New York or Cali, which I, which I do occasionally for folks who, you know, use my stuff here and really want quantities like that. But, um, all over Wyoming, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, states like that, there are people that, that carry it. And then, um, if, if you want it where you are and, and they don't have it, just talk to your store. <clears throat> we, we don't sell to big box stores. We only sell to, to your local stores. And that's a huge part of our strategy is working with these independent resellers who can support the soil. Most of them are organic farmers and growers themselves. And that's why we like working with these folks. And they really provide a service to their communities that, that I think people just looking for the lowest dollar don't always appreciate. So we want to keep these mom and pop local stores alive in a world of Amazon trying to wipe them out. And so, you know, go, go down to your store. Um, and, and if they don't have it available and you can look at our map on our website, it's peoniasoilco.com. And we've got a map of all the stores that we have out there. And if you want it in your area and they don't have us, um, have them give us a holler. Kate Graham, our sales director, she's she's on the game and she'll set set your store up and get them carrying us. And then hopefully in the next few years here, we'll start branching out and maybe open up a new mix facility on each coast or something like that. Um, but but for the moment, it's mostly the states surrounding Colorado. Yeah, a family-owned business. I mean, we got right. putting it together, and if not necessarily always a blood type family, but I, I notice your employees, you know, they give a shit. Especially Kate, you know, she just won the uh, the pot. Uh, what is that? Potting soil challenge. Potting so, challenge. Yeah, Probably. man. I mean, that's, that was awesome. Huh? Cool to see. Exactly. And I think yeah. when 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 your employees give a shit. It's really nice because then it allows you to start to focus on some other things in your business that you might not necessarily even tell the employees that you can kind of focus on. And 
uh, yeah, shout out to Kate because I do see her constantly working, constantly educating. Um, I usually see her now at the expos. I saw her uh, when we had that little private corner little meeting. Was it seemed like some of the bigger players in the gardening world. I, you know, I didn't even know really who those people were, but I could tell that they were big wigs by the way uh, they conducted themselves. That's it. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a family and a team. And you know, shout out to everyone on our team: Robbie, Pecos, um, all the folks that have that have been here for years. I. I'm not going to take the time to name them all, but everyone who works here is important to this company. And it's, it's part of our kind of mission and responsibility is that our employees have a good life and <clears throat> that our clients have a good life and that our stores do well. It's kind of a triangle. And if any one of those legs of the triangle isn't strong, then none of us are going to be strong. And so when people are like, oh, that costs... 10% more than whatever. It's like, well, man, you know, I, I, during COVID I had some, a nursery in Boulder just scorch me because we raised our prices and they dropped us and yet they're driving brand new cars, you know, and they don't give a, give an F. And it's like, look, if I, if I cut the price on this anymore, my guys aren't going to be eaten. Right. And so to really build the energy in a product like that, you have to have, you have to have the employees of the company doing well. You got to have the customer doing well. You got to have the store doing well. And and that's a tough balance to weigh at times. That's for sure. Well said. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, we appreciate your time, Bart. Uh, we've really been uh, trying to keep these at the three-hour mark, which we have hit. Oh, yeah. Uh, I didn't even think you would, you know, I mean, when, when I had the flu, I wouldn't have been doing the show. I think I even had to call Marco. Oh, no. uh, so yeah, man, to, to be able to do this, answer the questions, we just appreciate your time. And I hope more people see, uh, there's a reason why, uh, I try to promote you as, as best I can, wherever I go, uh, because there's something to your soil and then kind of building on that. If that's the playbook. Well, we got to have these special plays and that's where Marco stuff comes into play. That's where Mark stuff comes into play. That's where I've been adding fish brew to people that do have hydrophobic soils or soils that are just kind of sitting in the corner that they were trying to do with reptiles. Well, here's a way to improve on that kind of stuff. Uh, Marco even has some of the, the don't, don't you still sell like the Bakken Comfrey and some of the things we were mentioning today, some of the, oh, yeah. I would yeah, say almost yeah. rarer plants out there that you, you know, you can potentially get play around with. Uh, there's a lot of fun stuff, and if you guys just continue to support support Future Cannabis Project, letting Peter know, Dag of Love, obviously that's where you support him and uh, supporting us and our show uh, just by hitting that like button. That's all we ask. Uh, we just try to always, you know, keep it as simple as possible. And Bart, uh, you know, we dove into this right away. I think a lot of people already know who you are, but if you don't, check him out, man. This is somebody that uh, definitely understands uh, what's going on. And when I don't understand something or I'm confused on biochar, this is the gentleman that I reach out to to, to explain it. Thank so you, thank Brian. You, really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for getting the word out and for always having me on the show. It's fun. I really enjoy it. And uh, and thank you, Marco. I always learn something from you every show. And, and that's that's what I love about this show is – is there's so much community, so much love, and so much knowledge getting passed around. Yeah, that's what tells you took the words out of my mouth. You uh you teach us everything. It's a lot every time. So I got plenty of notes, plenty of things to highlight it. I want to look into the feather mill, gold bar. Um just yep. everything, man. Appreciate everything you share. This is you know, when these when guys like Bart come on. You got to watch this back because you're not going to catch it all on the first <laughs> listen. You know what I mean? We're all talking, having a good time. But a lot of nice gold bars are dropped in the middle of, of what we're doing here. So um, much. Uh, yeah. And best I guess, I, you. I guess I might drop yeah. a couple of the names of these studies that John Kemp put out in this article just for people. Yeah. To go look, but uh, uh, Dr. James White put okay. out some papers on mm -hmm. on rise of phagy um and really fascinating check check him out gerald pollock uh he did a bunch of the stuff describes how plants can transport live bacteria through their vascular tissue to all locations um and then and then this paper this uh 
this paper, Linking Plant Secondary Metabolites and Plant Microbiomes, a review. Um, you can pull it up on PubMed and stuff, but just a wealth of studies and information in that paper. So um, a lot of, a lot of really cool stuff happening in research right now. Right on. Well, we'll see you guys next week. Uh, also behind the scenes, we're hoping we can maybe do something with uh, Marco's going to Spanibus. So if, if there's something exciting, if we can kind of set it up where he can uh, do the show from somewhere, you know, somewhere remote like that. I don't know if that's even possible sometimes with the bandwidth. But just wanted to let you guys know that uh, there will be, a, you know, we won't have a show for one week because he's traveling. So uh, shout out to you, Marco, being able to travel more. That was kind of where we were talking these last few years, making yeah, sure. a little extra money for yourself, having the freedom uh, and free time to be able to go and do some of these things that are maybe once in a lifetime. You know, you never know with life, COVID, all that kind of stuff pops up. But the fact that you at least went uh, and that's something that, um, you know, I, I, if I wasn't having so many damn kids, man, I'd be right there with you. But that, there's something fun with being able to travel and see international people that are into cannabis. I mean, there's just, I know. You know, there's just something to fun. that, man. Yeah, and I can't wait to see really. how my beds get get on with me not being around. You know, I'm always talking that shit. Like, you can go on vacation with these living soil <laughs> beds, so we're gonna see this time. <laughs> That's it. The priest and the pudding. Exactly. The golden handcuffs, baby. Exactly. Yeah, and Galaxy <laughs> Solutions is saying they do buy local. They don't have any hydro stores. Um, look, look beyond the hydro stores. Like some of the local organic nurseries are the best. You know, they might not be oriented towards this plant, but um, they have a lot of knowledge, and that's a great way to uh, to get our soil into your areas just through like a really good nursery or garden center that cares about the community there. And almost every community has a nursery or garden center. And a lot of them have the nice 10 wheeler truck with the donkey forklift on it and can bring you the totes to your house. And that's a, that's a slick trick on, on getting us into your community. So, and it's right. all about shipping. Like I would, I would have it everywhere, but if I try and sell it on Amazon or something, the freight just eats it alive. Yeah. And so but I can I can send a truck to you, right? If I if we make a deal, absolutely. I can send a truck yeah. And, yeah. Anybody who wants to send a truck, if you're doing wholesale quantities, send your own truck. We'll load it right up. We we All love right. doing that. There you go. That's how you support the show, guys. We'll see you next week. Appreciate Cheers, each family. and every one Much of love. you. Thank y'all.